Uh, my name is Paul Hannigan, I'm the head of college here at the ATU Donegal, and you're really welcome here this morning to this event. It's a really special event from our perspective in terms of activity that's happening within our business faculty and our engagement within the globally and with ICT skill left, and especially with our partners in Southeast Technological University in the Engineer Tech Project as well. So it's a huge amount of activity going on in this space within the, the faculty of business in the ATU Donegal. We've been working on the FinTech Learning Labs for a number of years. We've been working with a lot of stakeholders locally as well in terms of a cluster development here within this region, which a lot of you are familiar with because it, some of you have come through the college as graduates, some of you are working now locally. And you know, we're really, really proud of the FinTech cluster that's developing within this region. And we want to continue to build that and develop that. And events like this, I think, are really important in terms of bringing yourselves together as a group, but also listening to the expertise of Paul uh, here this morning as well. A mentor of mine years ago told me, Paul, there's two things you can do if you're asked to speak about something. You can stand out, put up your hand and say, I don't know, or in second, you can open your mouth and prove you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this morning I'm not going to prove I don't know, I'm going to imagine what the expert who goes, no. I have some experience in this, but I've been scammed in the past myself as well, you know, it's some bit. Some of you probably more people have been to it today, but I'll put my hand up here as I was one of those people. So, you know, we know how this thing works and we know how to drive the thing. It's great that this event is doing most of here in the college this morning. Fantastic that so many of you have turned out good. Um, I'd like to thank David Roach for the work and putting it together this morning. And uh, obviously, Mike and all the staff in the faculty of business have continued work in this space. So, without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to the real expert here this morning. And I uh, really look forward to this conversation this morning. So, thanks very much for coming over me and I'll hand you over to Paul. Testing mic, yeah. I'm gonna hit the house lights one, do you do? One, yeah, nice. Um, so good morning, everybody. So my name is Paul Dwyer, and I've worked in the area of cybersecurity, risk, privacy, and protecting infrastructure from bad people for over 30 years around the world. We'll, we'll, we'll hit that topic as we go uh, uh, through our presentation this morning and through our master class. And we'll talk about its importance in relation to what you guys are doing in industry, what we're doing in relation to fintech. Red tech, all of the pieces of innovation that support our way of life in a society that I think will go forward. So I'm going to, I've got quite a peppered um, uh, content this morning because I want to show you how important it is um, that we take things like cyber security and freedom of arms seriously um, because it's important from a society's point of view as well as a business point of view. And um, I'm going to go through that. So I have a lot to get through, so I'm going to um, go at quite a pace. And we'll keep the questions till the end. So it's got a two halves this, this morning, guys. So maybe a minute to tune some one of the bits. Um, where it's only going to work, so let's get there. Um, but um, the second half, what I'll do is I'm going to talk about what we can do to fix this. But the first half, I'm going to talk about the problems. Don't get too scared of it in the first half as we go through. So the first thing to understand is we all live in two worlds. And in the real physical world, there's laws. There's social norms and there's consequences to things like crime. So, for example, if I want to steal David's laptop, I physically have to get to the asset. I have to get my hands on it and then I take it and I hope that nobody has witnessed me taking it or there's no CCTV that, and if there has been, which there probably is, um, then they can get law enforcement involved and they can do what we call attribution. I can face court or I can go to jail. And he may have offset the risk of losing the laptop because he may have insured, he may have transferred the risk of losing that. And the insurance company can pick up the time. And the laptop is probably worth a few hundred quid or whatever it's worth at the end of the day. But if I'm a cyber criminal, I can be anywhere in the world. I don't need to get physically connected to it. And I can steal what's much more valuable on David's laptop, which is the data. And he won't even know it's gone because he won't notice it's gone. And I can sell that, I can copy it, I can sell it multiple times, over and over again. And that's why criminals are running a trillion dollar industry, which is surpass blue trafficking as a number one crime in the world. Or we have organized criminal groups, or we have the cartels, or we have the terrorist groups involved in this area because it is so lucrative, so easy to do, and it's so hard to get caught and face any kind of attribution. So the normal route to criminal enterprise, if you like, is violence, or your propensity to be violent. Um, it's either you're willing to, to hurt somebody, you're willing to put a gun in somebody's face, or your family or your gang has a reputation for being violent, and therefore people will, if you like, acquiesce to you and they will comply and you will be a successful criminal because you're violent. But, one of the differences in the cyber world is, a lot of the criminals are certainly not violent. 
a lot of them, uh, we can talk more about this as, as we go on maybe in the Q&A session, are actually victims themselves. I mean, they, they, when we look at the statistics of who's caught for criminal behavior, most of them are young kids who themselves have become victims of this and maybe on the spectrum, maybe have Asperger's, and they're the ones being manipulated by the criminal enterprises to carry out a lot of this activity. So they're using their brilliant brains and they're being taken advantage of too. So we see this uh, because it's almost an extension of online game playing, but they, they, the, the moral decision of being a criminal is mental. They simply are being used to do that. So when we look at the major different kind of threat actor groups, we see they all have different kinds of motivations. So for example, when we look at fin crime, we have criminals who may want to profit from a money perspective. You might think, well, don't all criminals to get involved in some government wants to do it for, uh, to make profit, to make some money. Well, not all. You know, nation states that will do it for cheap political reasons, also economic advantage. Um, you may have hacktivists that do it for ideological reasons. Um, so there's a lot of stuff with ISIS, Al Qaeda, and so on, that will do for that. And also they'll be used for things like terrorist groups, which are used for propaganda, for violence. Um, so you can see this kind of blurred line between these threat actor groups. Um, thrill seekers, so this is all from the ones that we refer to as things like script kiddies. These are the people who tend to get caught in the media, like, you know, a 13, 14 year old hacker takes down a billion dollar corporation, kind of that matter. Um, and a lot of them will, will use what we call crime or scripts. That's how they get the name script kiddies. Um, they're not necessarily highly technical, um, but they've been playing around uh, on systems. And guess what? The systems are so insecure that they found it like Charles Bates of And when you actually look at the names of some of these groups, some of you may be familiar with correctly, groups like Anonymous, and splinter groups like the Lulzac. Will say show for LOL, LOL, laugh out loud security because the security was so weak on systems that it was laughable how easy it was to break into the systems. And that unfortunately is the reality of today. Most systems are just, the security was so inadequate that a child can actually break into them uh, within minutes. Um, and, and what you get here really is, it's like a Venn diagram. These groups are overlapping each other and your adversary is somewhere in the middle. So if you're worried about fin crime, if, if, you, if you're part of your remit, if part of your challenge or objective is to protect organizations and their data and their innovation and their technology, well then you're worried about terrorists, then you're worried about security kiddies, then you're worried about nation states or all nation states because they're all working together. That's why you're so successful because they collaborate, they help each other, they teach each other, and they all work within this underground ecosystem uh, that is so successful. And we see from the fin crime uh, pathways that this is all merging between financial crime, between fraud, and between the cyber crime elements. So we can't treat this in silos anymore. We can't say, oh, that's not our issue, that's IT security, or that's GRC, or, or that's red tech, or that's whatever else we have to put off so We all have to collaborate in order to be able to deal with this. The technologists have to collaborate with the, the legal people and the regulation people. It is a combined effort in order to be able to defeat what I often refer to as cyber evil, and we can speak a bit more about that. So there's the elephant in the room. I have to talk about this be anything at this moment when the next slide comes up. But what I want to talk about is, if you can imagine, we have a density to try and pigeon all things about, well, that's this, so that's a, that's a cyber crime, or, or, or that's built up to that area, or whatever it has to be. But the reality is when you look at cyber threats and anything to do with financial crime, and anything to do with people circumventing systems and flow and so on, it's like a group of blind people walking into a room, and they're feeling around, and essentially what they're feeling is an elephant, but they're coming at it from different angles, a different perspective. And that different perspective, they come to the back of the elephant, they might think they're dealing with a rope. At the front, they might think they're dealing with a snake or a spear or whatever it's been. But everything all leads back to the one thing. It's cyber evil. It's basically cyber threat actors. So you can't pigeonhole yourself off on a silent thing. We're doing a great job because we're working against uh, carvers or working against a particular kind of cyber criminal. You have to look at it holistically. You have to, that's the, that's the challenge in dealing with this, being holistic in your approach and strong leadership in dealing uh, with, with the cyber challenge. And uh, we'll go into more about that. So what are these guys after? And what are they targeting? They're targeting your systems, your employees, your suppliers, your customers, and your money. Data is the new cash. If they steal your money, lots of anti-fraud systems will, will, will spot this straight away and they'll get caught pretty quickly. But if they steal your data, they can sell it many, many times over and over again. And there's been sensational demand for this. Um, we've had, obviously, crime has been around since the year dot. Um, and there's always been this cat and mouse game between the good guys and the bad guys. But we're always going to be behind the cyber criminal element because they are well-funded, 
they don't have the same rules and regulations that they have to adhere to that we have to. Um, so, for example, one ransomware guarantee that we've been surveilling for a while has about 50 million in Bitcoin sitting in a wallet and they haven't touched any of them. That's how rich they are. And they invest in lots of architecture, lots of innovation. And, and these aren't guys working out of bedrooms. These are, uh, I'll talk a little bit later about what I'm in the HSC in Ireland and so on. These are um, well organized startups that become really successful technology companies. They're your opposite of what you're doing in the world of fintech and everything else. They're the dark side of that. But they have marketing departments, they have research and development, they have HR departments. They are organized corporations you know, working from that perspective. If you look at this a little bit deeper, depending on the kind of organization you are, depends on the kind of target that is after you. Um, and it, again, the blurred lines between these groups, we can see from the very unsophisticated threat actors on the left, who maybe just doing it for their crack. Uh, and just doing it because they think this is fun. I mean, it, it, in the last 24 hours, I've talked to some people about things like IoT devices, showdown, and there's an insatiable curiosity in all of us really, is it that easy to hack into something? I think not with all of that, because it's a thrill to break into something and produce something that isn't a problem, you know, allowed and be able to go in and make them to a CCTV camera, or maybe just simply understand how simple it is to break into these devices and how still. So you get thrill seekers on one side, all the way up to state sponsored stuff, um, and we talk about advanced persistent threats and the likes of Putin and what's going on there um, around the cyber criminal world. Now, one of the catalysts in all this has been the dark web. Um, for those of you who aren't that familiar with what the dark web is, um, essentially the internet and the surface web is everything you find through Google or Bing or whatever your, your favorite search engine is. And that's probably somewhere between 3 and 5% of the internet. The rest of it is all out there, but you don't actually find it on Google, you don't find it on Bing. And um, the clever folks in the United States Navy, who have researchers, aka spies, um, they were aware that every time that they were surveilling or investigating different people or sites and so on, that their IP addresses were being identified and it was easy for these people to know that that was the United States Navy, it was military intelligence, and that they were investigating. So they developed a piece of software called Tor, the only version. And um, it's a non-standard protocol on the internet. And so it was very obvious then that this was still the United States Navy using this non-standard protocol that was visiting these websites. So they went, you know what we'll do? We'll give it to everybody for free. So they gave it out. And what this does is it's like an invisibility file. When you load the tour, nobody can tell where you're coming from, who you are, what you're doing, in theory. In theory is very important. Um, so all of the bad guys were their hands said, this is how it's happening. So 80% of the traffic. Um, on tour is child predators. <clears throat> Probably the other 19% of the rest of the traffic are nefarious actors such as criminals, terrorists, and uh, basically evil people doing anything from torturing animals, human trafficking, all of those kind of things, all down to the criminal underworld. So you can understand where I'm using the terms of the cyber evil. And when you get into that world and understand what they're about, it is really an evil, dark place. Okay. The dark web has been, uh, the deep web, we should say the dark web is part of the deep web, and it's meant to be technically correct. And um, part of that has been useful in things like the Arab Spring, people that have tried to maybe, uh, they're being surveilled, journalists, things like that, have found it very useful to be able to help them. So, this is a few snapshots um, by drugs, by endangered species, uh, by guns, by counterfeit uh, IDs. Uh, insider information to the stock exchange, uh, learn how to plant a bomb, the Islamic State, all the instructions, how to put rat poison on the nails, where it's planted so that the uh, infection when the bomb goes off. This is the real stuff, that's, what, that's what's on the dark web. Inside the red box here is a murder for hire website where you can, depending on the person that you're targeting, if you want them murdered, raped, crippled, bombed, whatever you want, different places to spend on your body That's the world. This takes three minutes to get access to it. And there's nothing illegal about accessing it. Jesus. So anybody can download the tour, put it on the device, and, and work away. And what you find is generationally, um, and just look around, and maybe a, a generation behind uh, most of us in this room um, will be on that quite a bit for different reasons. Maybe they want to order other paraphernalia or things that are on the maybe the right hand side of the page. Um, you, you take, for example, we talk about innovation, Silk Road, in the top right hand side there. Silk Road was a marketplace. Think eBay, think Amazon, and it was a community for people to buy drugs, but it was based on the fact that the community 
will give you feedback on how good or bad that dealer was. Because it's actually matter you can't trust someone else, especially a criminal online. Um, so we have this third party escrow arrangement for payments and the community feedback and everything else. Like they did a bill in the first year. Imagine having a fintech or a tech company did a bill in the first year. And it's only when you cross the line with the United States you really get them hassle and start getting taken down. And it's a fascinating story about the Silk Road uh, itself. And this is human organs, um, and that's why we have the trafficking of uh, children and uh, humans around the world who are being harvested for organs as well. That's the reality of the kind of things that are online as well. Get back to this sensational demand. Why are they continually hacking? Why do they want what we call FULLS, F-U-L-L-Z? That is your data that would be used within the financial service industry, for example, your billing address, your date of birth, your name, all those kind of things. Because they want to use it for fraud, they want to use it for finger point. And the fresher it is, just like fruit, uh, the more expensive it is. And if it's been stolen and, they, and you don't know it's been stolen, it's the highest price. And then one of the stock exchanges, you know, we've sold it multiple times and the price comes down. Um, and these stock exchanges are fascinating, with unbelievable user interfaces, um, sell it to me, great customer care, and five star customer care. And there's lessons to be learned. These are innovators, these are entrepreneurs who are online creating these services and these businesses to support a trillion dollar economy. These are some of the roles, these are some of the players that are involved. I won't go through them all, but what, what's interesting is you have hosted system providers, what we call bulletproof hosting. Companies who are set up that will provide hosting to criminals to carry out financial crime and other kinds of crime. And, and won't give their details away. Uh, a lot of these will appear to be legitimate businesses as well, and they'll be on the surface one. Um, a lot of these tools that you'll see being sold um, online for surveilling or hacking into someone's phone will be sold as a legitimate tool to say, are you worried about your child or do not be on your phone? So on. buy this software and you can listen to the phone calls, you can read your text messages, you can get your GPS position and so on. It's not a useful tool for criminals to put someone's phone into tracking them and they want to understand, you know, what passwords we're using and everything else like that. So a lot of these are in plain sight, these kind of devices. Um, fraudsters, hack hackers, tech experts, making vast amounts of money around the world, providing these services. And none of them really ever meet in the real world. Very rarely do they ever meet in the real world. They just work through these online communities. Um, and again, what I, I mentioned the term here, primary. Primary is software designed to carry out crime. Um, and then you have CAAS, Primer as a service. So even if you can't be bothered downloading or buying the primer to carry out something like a DDoS attack, you just feel like a service attack, and you flood something in traffic and take down a website because you're angry with whatever it has to be, or you want to steal information from somebody or survey or, or put on a keyboard and log or something, so you type up in a password that you can see the password. You can just outsource it for a few dollars. You can go, listen, I want you to do this, here's the target, go off and do it. And you say you're paying job, and that will be done. And it's carrying that. And the whole industry, the whole community is there to do that. We're probably all familiar with terms and unfortunately the impact of things like ransomware. And this is interesting, well, the financial service industry, insurance, and so on like that, because a couple of years ago, I was talking about ransomware. We'll probably skip over quite briefly. Yeah, ransomware, yeah, it's one of these things where it kidnaps your data. And that's essentially what it does. It's a kidnap. It's a kidnap attack. And what they do is they will. Uh, infiltrate your system, put this piece of software on, and you still see your data, but you can't access it. It's all basically garbage and gobbledygook, really, and then they will go try and open up these files because they've all been um, encrypted, and they want you to pay a ransom before they will give you access back to your data. Um, and there's lots of schools of thought whether ransom should be paid or not paid, and if you do pay them, do you actually get your data back? All that good stuff, it's a whole other whole, whole talk. But the effect of this was, well, I was talking two years ago, we were going to be talking about ransoms of $1,000, $5,000 that were being paid. Uh, ransoms are now millions of dollars. And that's because insurance companies decided that they pay ransoms. So all the criminals went, this is what we focus on. Right? Why are we bothering with all this other stuff? We can be so lucrative because all these big insurance companies are just paying out. If you have some insurance, they're just paying out. And there's, uh, and there's a moral decision there, there's an ethical decision. Because that fuels uh, the, this, this crossover between criminals, evil, terrorism, and all those kind of things that are going on, and fueled all that. So there's a great debate within the insurance industry, um, indeed, because they lost so much money around this whole area, because they were essentially insuring things that they weren't quite sure of what they, the risks they were taking on when, when they were insuring certain, uh, certain entities. And these guys, when they take payments, 
you think, well, can't we just trace the payment? So, said, well, scripture currency is much harder to do that. These guys will use services like mixers and tumblers. So these are other bright entrepreneurs who set up services online on the dark web. And what they will do is they will launder your cryptocurrency for you. So if I'm going to send uh, some cryptocurrency or Bitcoin out to David, what will happen is it will just go into the tumbler, it will go to somebody else, and somebody else's currency will come in and go to David, and you can't trace the relationship between the sudden tech that payment is being made. Um, that service providing makes us a tumbler to take a small commission off the top. So the money laundering has become so much easier for criminals to follow because they now outsource it, their money laundering services. This is a price list. Uh, the prices are kind of indicative, but they change too often that they're only indications of what's there. But what's more important is if you look, we've got sort of three categories here. We've got the tactiles, we've got data, we've got services. So it, the successful people at the top end of the FinCoin cybercoin uh, industry are people, people. They're organizers, they're project managers. They're not necessarily the technical people. And what they do is, just like we all do with the industry, we get talents of people, we get teams, and we put them together with one deliberate project. So here's all your pieces from the project. Do I need database records? Do I need something earlier to need us to tap? Do I need a key logger? Uh, put it in the book of a really system. What do I need to do here? And I can just hire my people, get my tools, carry out the project, and keep my hands clean. And that's why the Mr. and Mrs. Big of cyber farming rarely get caught at the end of the day. Now, I want to talk a little bit about what we call the fifth domain. So we have warfare. <coughs> Section 4 domains about land, sea, air, and space. But now we'll have cyberspace. And I've been referring to this for, for over 10 years. It's only really in the last year or so people are really realizing that cyber warfare is something that we're dealing with on a day to day basis. Because um, it was the Economist magazine came up with this term in the fifth domain. Because what we're seeing is that blurred line between geopolitics and between cyber security and cyber risks and criminality. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the roles, the career roles within cybersecurity as we go through. One of the most interesting things is, I was talking last night to someone said, most of the reading I do these days is on geopolitics. Because that, that's why the, the cybersecurity industry is so interesting. It might come with the technical piece, it might come with the legal piece, regulatory, uh, other pieces. Why would people be so great on cybersecurity? Because we're amazing communicators. You know? And that's what's missing generally in the world, the people that can communicate around this and around the risk and policy. Uh, the red tech piece and all those pieces that need, need to do with that. Um, and, and this is a very real element of it that we're seeing on a day to day basis. In the first summit between Putin um, and Biden, they have this theory that they call mad, mutually redestruction. Right? They try and avoid mad. So it's I will press the media weapon, the people press the media weapon. So what they did in their first summit was they agreed 22 red lines that they wouldn't pass with each other. 22 things that we'll do from a cyber perspective to each other. So it is not the Geneva Convention on cyber warfare, but there is in warfare. So you're not meant to bomb civilians, you're not meant to bomb hospitals, and doctors, but there are no rules to cyber warfare. But these two guys decided that they were going to have some rules with each But the rest of the world can be collateral damage, and that's why we're seeing lots of posture in what we call cyber collateral damage going on, which brings a lot of these entities that are going on. And these are what we refer to as APTs, Advanced Persistent Threats. And a lot of people think an APT is an advanced piece of malware. And sometimes it is. Malware is evil software, if you like, that they use to carry out things. Um, but APTs are essentially a person or an entity that can use advanced and persistent techniques to carry out what they want to do. So, if it's the People's Liberation Army in China, it can begin with 613 If it's Israelis, it can begin with they will carry out, they're not necessarily doing something for really cost benefit or return on investment in mind from a monetary perspective. They will go to much greater cost to carry out what they want to do. So it's for a geopolitical reason, they will use these zero day uh, threats. Zero day threats are essential vulnerabilities against systems that are zero day nobody knows about them. Um, if they're sold in the black market, they sell for $100,000, $200,000. But a government, an APT actor, and a rogue nation state actor would use five or six of these to carry out whatever they want to do. And that may be to uh, undermine democracy, undermine country stability, their confidence in their government, whatever it happens to be as well. And they're often targeting what we call the backbone of society. 
So the water system in Ireland is being attacked, the electricity grid in Ireland is being attacked, the gas system in Ireland is being attacked. It's all being attacked by threat actors all of the time. Because you don't need to drop a bomb on a country if you can control their infrastructure, if you can control the railway, if you can control the air navigation space. You don't, that's what you need to be able to do, and that's what these guys are about. And the legacy to all of these kind of systems is they've been designed to be reliable, but not necessarily not necessarily secure. So they're actually very easy in many cases to actually circle around to control those things. We have the equivalent of this in our homes, it's called IoT, the Internet of Things. A kettle that's on the internet, a light bulb that's on the internet, a treadmill that's on the internet, an expert on the internet. All of these things are the backbone of your domestic society, your domestic ecosystem, and all of those are vulnerable. And you go into well, the lifestyle we'll be talking about that in a moment, but we'll look at things like Shogun. Um, I talked a little bit about this last night just in conversation. Shogun, for those of you who don't know what it is, um, I mentioned the internet, Google, and for most people that's the internet one they when they type in search their internet. Shogun is a search engine that indexes all of those things in your home. Your TV, your baby camera, <laughs> your kettle, your light bulbs, all of those things. And you can go to that for free and you can search for devices in your neighborhood. And when you click on them, they'll come up and say, hmm, this is a site tech which you're not interested. Um, you open up another tab and say, what's the default username and password for a site tech build of it, 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 it. Great, go back and try it, 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 it. Nine times out of ten, you're going to be in that device with their controls. You turn on the microphones, you turn on all the cameras, you do what you want with the CCTV systems and TVOs. That system, that's out there. Then you can actually pay for access to make it easier to do uh, within the system. So databases, traffic lights, uh, electrical control systems, everything is all over Showdown. Um, and there's lots of different versions of Showdown out there, there as well. So this is the reality of what's living in these two worlds. Our digital society and the real world we live in has become probably more and more dependent on our digital society. We need to be aware that we all have to play a part in securing that as well. And we'll talk about that in the second half. I mentioned uh, APTs, um, uh, advanced persistent threats, threat actors. Some of them to be aware of the bad players, uh, if you like China, um, Russia, famously uh, bad players in this space because what they have is essentially military units. Um, and their job is to hack into systems around the world, in Europe, in the United States, and so on. And by the way, there's another bad player, it's called America as well, it's called the United Kingdom. Everybody is at this. So I'm not just picking on China and Russia, but famously, a lot of the cases will lead back to the, the, the likes of this. And what we'll see is this geopolitical posture where the FBI in America will put out a warrant to arrest soldiers in another country. So where's the lines between warfare and criminality where you're trying to arrest a soldier for carrying out what you would call a criminal act in your country? And how do you defend against that? It's an unfair fight if you're a business, if your organization is trying to defend against a military unit who are, are not working as a criminal court to which will. They risk certain amounts of money and effort for certain amount of return. When it's a nation state, they do not care. 24 7. They will just hand me with this military and simply I'm trying to get through systems and on that basis. And we see this geopolitical posture in the news all the time. You might realize what we're seeing. So the, the United States may come out with a political comment that is negative, and this is pre the invasion in Ukraine. Um, you, you'd have the likes of um, a negative comment from the United States about some of the activity going on from Russia, and then all of a sudden an icon of America will be taken down. That's a shot across the bow, that's a warning back to the Americans to say, enough for now, enough for your talk, and we will do that. And that's what we see all the time. And after this talk, we're going to realise that we're going to see oh, that's just on the back of another comment from that, that political leader, but that's on the back of another comment. This cyber skirmishes, this cyber collateral kind of damage that's going on all the time, uh, is going on under our eyes. Um, Anissa, from a European perspective, do an amazing job of researching uh, and a lot of activities they have around um, Syria. And if you're in the fintech space, if you're, uh, you need to be very aware of this. You need to be very aware of the billions in funding that's available now from Europe based on the EU strategy. Um, because one thing Europe is very good at is understand that we are a digital society and they are funding uh, so many areas and supporting so many areas around this to deal with the cybersecurity threat. Because even one, one thing, for example, the Network Information Systems Strategy, um, piece of legislation on board, and the revised version just went as well. That was that 500 billion lost the GDP of Europe. One piece of legislation, 500 billion lost the GDP of Europe. So they can see that this is the, the key to success. 
um, of everything across Europe. And that's why the funding strategy is, is really, really good. It's harmonising a lot of the challenges between transatlantic legislation and laws around cyber security and so on. Um, we'll get a little bit deeper into that. But this is what I want you to be focused on as well. It's the emerging threats. And the emerging threats are things like nobody knows cyber security. There's 6 million open cyber security jobs. Less than 10% of the industry is female. It's ridiculous. 6 million jobs. That's 90% male. It's crazy. So, um, the jobs, uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of these career moves as well. I mean, we're paying over a million dollars for cheap information security, that's just a max. Why are they doing that? Because they're like evil ones. <laughs> you can't buy them. Um, and it's funny people that understand something beyond. Firewalls and <coughs> systems. People understand business. People understand how businesses operate, how processes work. That's what they're looking for within organisations. Um, artificial intelligence, all these pieces of areas, well, part of the emerging threat landscape that we're deal with. I just want to walk you through standard kind of attack. Um, so this is the anatomy of an attack. When we talk about this, is the cyber kill chain. So if you're looking here, it's kind of ten steps in a chain. And if you can break this chain at any point, you're starting the bad. So point number one, um, if I was a bad guy, is I would do some reconnaissance. So if I was going through, let's say, for example, um, hack the HU David, I'm writing this on Constantine David. It's called Doxing, D-O-X-I-N-G, sometimes spelled D-O-X-S-I-N-G. What that means is I look at social media, I'll find out what his family names are, what his pet names are, whose friends are. They. It starts with the white book roll out and we'll draw it all out and say, okay, well, where's our in to this guy? How can we get something out of it? Um, and what they're trying to do is craft those psychological hooks so when they send David an email, he's more likely to click on the link. So if they've been in his email in the last few days, they would have faked an email from me saying, uh, David, just wondering about what we mean for dinner or something like that, he would have clicked on it. Or here's the attachments so that he possibly would be more likely to click on it. That's it. Uh, to click on. So they will use that with constants that don't <coughs> yeah. So when they attacked me, one of the things they did in the class was they, they targeted my eight little stepdaughter at the time and they were going through her laptop to get to me. They will use any room that they can um, to find a way in to your home, into your business, into your office, whatever, and try to turn on microphones on her laptop to hear what was going on at home, to find out could they get something to coerce me and to control what was going on. Those, those kind of things. So they start off with this, they gather all the information, um, they'll then weaponize and they'll choose their weapon from the other graph. So go back to that list and decide, hmm, we're going to hack in, we need to craft a phishing email, a spear phishing email. So a phishing email is when I send out a million emails pretending to be my car. A spear phishing email is where I'm targeting specifically a person and I have specific details and I'll be much more specific than what I do. Send that, send that, that, the link. I may have the malware, uh, uh, pixel, I think, and so on, and I target the individual. And I send a David email, he clicks on it, and a little piece of software will. So it might be that I've sent him an attachment PDF, and the PDF has its open dispatch through a quick send, and it's loaded something like a domain. But David has antivirus software installed in the email saying It's about 60-70% effective to be because it's just one of the ones that depends. And to break it, a piece of malware to attack it, I wouldn't use a standard piece. It would take me all of about eight seconds to create a signature in that that would not be detected by your antivirus. So anybody beyond page one or one of the side of the room is getting past your anti malware most, most of the time. Um, but it's point of vulnerability that they'll install the malware and then they will uh, establish control what we call the C2 server, the command and control server. And here's one of the business that get involved in this. Okay, so if I'm a criminal and I want to attack, um, the back of Ireland. What I will do is I will probably attack one of their suppliers or friendly IP address first. And they are often the victims they don't realise and their systems are being used as part of the attack and they have a pivotal attack from there. And I'll install my command control service software on that. So when I've installed my malware on David's laptop as a bad guy, it's following kind to a legitimate business who's also being uh, attacked by me and has the crime control server in there. And I control everything there, and then I will attack from David's laptop into the bank of or wherever it happens to be. And that's it. That's why you have multiple companies involved and don't even realize the part of the crime at the end of the day. And to cover the tracks, they will often do things like they'll have indecent imagery, children in the child abuse imagery installed in all of the systems. 
so that if they do get caught, what they do is they just make that publicly aware, and then the guards are involved, put it on speed, and the bad guys are gone to the hills while everything is slowed down. Clubs. Well, what happened? What happened? Off? Why are they to be uh, taken down and being cloned or all the way the slow? They'll then move laterally across the network. So, one of the things about ransomware, one of the things about the HTC attack was the lack of segmentation, like you segregation of the networks. And what it meant was if I'm on the machine and I've got in, I am now inside the camp. I didn't see any of the data you can see on the network because it's a flat network, if it was a flat network, uh, in a case like that. And they will be able to see anything. So, now, the trust we give our employees, the trust we give people internally, I have inherited this bad guy, and I'm able to see everything you can see. Because all your defenses were about keeping me inside. Like one of the simple things to do, they'll often put your media room this floating wired, and they put a wired structure, then they'll go and sit in the car park. They're on your network. They just put a wired structure on your network. It's floating wired, they're on the network, they say everything you can see. These are the simple techniques I'll do. If I was trying to break into the HQ of my Always swallow where people smoke here, and I might get a USB key and put an HU paywall in the middle of the road and leave it on the ground. Someone pick that up, come down, and pop into the laptop. I mean, these are the social engineering kind of attack that they would use, and they kind of very most of them that they would use. It's between the real world and the cyber world, they'll often be blended. So, as a little round of finals there, I'll then exploit that internal advantage from the inside your network, um, and then I'll start exfiltrating data or do whatever I was going to do. Um, whether that's ransomware, if I've encrypted all your data, whatever it happens to be, I will carry out all my bad activity in that. Now, the final stage I will do, because I'm a nice guy, a nice girl, I'm going to set lots of alarm systems and I'm going to protect your network. You're now going to stay at guard security. Because as a security expert, I'm going to make sure no bad guys are coming in. Why? Because I'm a professional criminal, and I don't want another criminal coming into my territory. And I also want to know if law enforcement is seeing them there or anybody else is following them. So I'll set up all these triggers and all these alarms all around the systems and I'll protect you. Because on average, I will be on your network for at least two years before you even realize the name. And that's how it operates. Um, and they will just parasitically suck the data, suck the blood for, from that organization as much as possible. They don't want to trigger fall alarms. They will, they will work out the sensitivity on the anti fault systems and so on like that as much as possible. Because the fiber criminal is the one that's going to hang in the long grass log game and keep working away on that basis. So I'll give you a, just a, uh, a real life uh, example of uh, some of this criminal behaviour. We talked about that, that whole piece of violence and people often say to me, well, there's, uh, there's no relationship between um, violence and cyber criminals, isn't it? Soft crime and all the other bits. Well, we're going to look at a real life cyber place. It took uh, place in February 19th in 2013 in New York City. And um, this guy, Walked walk up to an ATM and uh, on 2381 rate, and all he had was a four inch piece of plastic. He had a hoodie on, he went up to an ATM and he withdrew um, cash of $1,000. What sort of did. So his first withdrawal was $1,000 with his bank account. Then, at that first ATM, he took $4,015. He walked along and left money on the ATM. He walked along 11 miles, this is his route. He walked all around on that island. Uh, to 110 ATMs and he filled that backpack bloody cash. $300,000 in that backpack by the time he's finished his 11 mile walk. It took him all day, so it's a good day's work. At exactly the same time, with military precision in 24 other countries, there was people doing the same thing. Exactly the same. Exactly the same time, the, on different time zones, everything else this. This was being carried out like a military operation all around the world. Um, there was 36,000 withdrawals, $40 million <coughs> was taken from bank and his staff and it came. So let's look at what happened there. Um, the prepaid debit cards from the bank and his staff account were um, basically um, hacked so that it was taken off. The codes to create those storage pieces of plastic so they could put it into the care. They were sent out to these what we call flash mobs. Again, these were people that nobody knew who anybody was. It was all controlled to the dark web, which it was communities. And think of the coordination that takes across 34 countries, 36 sets of controls, to organize crews, people we've never met, how that works, how that trust chain works, that nobody did it too early, nobody did it too late, all that good stuff. Um, they sent those out to the, the foot soldiers on a limited operation, because cash and crews 
uh, in the flash mobs, we're all working out through the instant messaging sites and and handing it off. And this is how the new has worked. I'm going to break down what this looks like in the real world. So you have the cyber criminal mastermind, you might have a hacker that broke in and was able to circumvent the prepaid debit cards, but then you've got a money mule manager and money mules. Now often you'll see as you drive around, work from home, earn extra cash, all that kind of stuff. They're often money mule scams. What they're trying to do is to say, we are a company moving into Ireland and we're hiring a local representative and we want you to work from home. And they will pay probably for the first two, three weeks, maybe the first couple of months. Then all of a sudden they say to you, we need to put, um, we have not moved a company bank account, we have to we do, we're going to put 20,000 into your bank account. And if you can transfer 18,000 over by Western Union, and uh, if you do it to your trouble, that would be great. You just want the cash. It's students fall, technically fall for this. It's well known students know what they're doing, but will often get involved in the, the uh, scams as well. It's, it's a very fast way of making money and attribution very difficult uh, on that side as well. So the issues which come with these guys, we have Alberto, uh, his nickname is Prime. We have uh, Jose Familia Reyes, and he was, a new, he was the guy that you saw working around. But the alpha in that group uh, was this guy known as Prime, Alberto. Uh, here's the two lads here. Uh, now these guys are low level, Basically, gosh, I'm full of kind of criminals like hanging on walls together. They all live within a few minutes of each other on Stratton Street, which is uh, kind of a working class area in, in uh, just outside uh, New York. And they were just kind of petty criminals, but on the internet, they got lured into this world of becoming fast cash, becoming money meals. So the entire crew was from there, there's eight of them all together. And between those eight people, uh, did 2,900 withdrawals, 2.4 million. Between eight, Young fellas, basically, that hang around on the street corner, but got involved in the scam. It's like, this is great. So all of a sudden, they're loading the cash. Now, there was a dry run done on Rack Bank. Rack is one of the entrants in the UAE, and five million was paid. But the lesson that is, Rack Bank didn't tell anybody else about what happened, <laughs> how it happened, what it looked like the attack. If they kind of shared that intelligence, <laughs> maybe back in Moscow, we have $14 million. Um, and they all worked through sites like this. So this site is one of the first ever one of these supermarkets for criminals. And this one was actually on the surface where it's called Carl Plan. I find it interesting because the guy who set up was a guy called Jamisha Kulubov. Jamisha Kulubov uh, was from Odessa in Ukraine. Um, the way of life back there was essentially criminality and he was an entrepreneur. And he said so he realized that it was actually like one criminal would one trust another. So he created this marketplace where he would act as the escrow. So if you're selling stolen data, you agree the price, he checks it out, he passes it on, he takes his commission passes on with the funds, and, and he became very well paid out of that. He was clever enough to get dirt on politicians because when he was arrested, a MasterCard were not allowed to turn in court to have him convicted, and he, uh, he, he was thrown out of court in, in politician and went on to buy lots of big money. So he's done very well for himself. But uh, this is him, went on to be a politician, and uh, tried to be mayor of Ukraine as well. This guy, on the other hand, is Roman Vega. He is a very clever individual who invented the double escrow system. Um, uh, or, or, or this trust system online, so an innovator, very clever guy, but unfortunately he's in jail. Why is he in jail? Because he was part of that scoop when they arrested him, but he didn't have dirt on people, so he had no leverage. So he served the time, it was the other guys got away with, with everything. This is our friends from Stratton Street. This is the real photographs from the social media sites. So it didn't take the smartest FBI agent in the world to work out who had stolen all the money, because these guys were literally on Facebook, Putting them pictures of Rolex watches and all the stuff they bought and everything else like that. So they were promptly arrested. Uh, and they had a couple of million dollars of cash in one of the bags and the rest of one of the times. Um, but the top guy, he did work. And he went back to the Dominican Republic, the law was in the Dominican Republic. And he's sitting there thinking he got away with it. He says, This is all fine. And he's playing dominoes with his friends. And the door gets kicked open and he's shot dead. That is the ordinary experience that came and back to themselves. So we want to find out what really happened. Uh, and the end of the story. In Brooklyn today, a Turkish man who used his computer to loot millions from cash machines was sentenced to eight years. How did he do it? Here's Josh Elliott. 35 year old Ershan Findikolu is the mastermind behind one of the most intricate bank robberies in history. A crime so brazen he posed with a pile of cash on his chest. Secret Service agent Scott Serapi says millions were taken from ATMs in New York City alone. Block after block, ATM after ATM, they hit them all. They had it mapped out and they knew that Broadway 
had a large number of ATMs in close proximity to each other. From Turkey, Findikolu hacked into the computers of international banks, stole account information, and then sent ATM numbers to criminal gangs around the world he'd recruited online. He also removed all withdrawal limits from the accounts. Gang members seen here on surveillance cameras then went to work, hitting machines from Tokyo to London to New York, where Ken Primo is a Secret Service agent. They came and emptied these. Yes, multiple transactions. Put your card in, put your pens in, take out the women. Put your card in, put your pens in, take out your women. Back in Turkey, Findikolu was watching it all. He was watching so that he could tell who was withdrawing how much, so that he knew how much money he was supposed to get back. The first hit happened in February of 2011. 15,000 transactions in 18 countries. $10 million were stolen. The second hit was December 2012. 5,000 transactions in 20 countries. $5 million were withdrawn. Then the big score, February 19, 2013. In a little over 10 hours, Cruz made some 36,000 transactions in 24 countries for a take of $40 million in cash. The thieves sent most of the money back to Findicolu, but started showing off their take, cash and expensive watches. Their end came at a mob movie staple, a New York diner, where police arrested one gang member, carrying almost $1 million. But Dave Beach, who runs the Secret Service office in New York, says most of the money has not been recovered. Gone. Just gone. It was cash. It's untraceable. The operation was in fact so sophisticated that by that massive third theft, Scott Fendicolo had determined which ATMs carried the most cash of all and so instructed his crews to hit those first. An evil genius, Josh Elliott, then. So guys, that's what a real life cybercrime looks like, or one variant of, of the cybercrime when it's all pulled together. Um, I think it's probably good so the stage managed to take a break. Um, yeah. So the first part of this session is we talked a lot of threat actors out there, how they operate and how they operate between each other. Um, I'll also change um, approach a little bit in this second uh, uh, now if you like. Um, or talk about a little bit about the solutions. But before I get into that meat of that subject, which is a bit heavier and not as entertaining, but frankly, because it's what's on the frameworks, which are controls, approaches, and so on like that, but it's the learning piece of the takeaways that you can take from here today. I just want to talk about some of the real life stuff around the geopolitics and cyber crime. Um, again, um, I never do the same presentation twice, so when we get the feedback, we were able to change the material. Even last night, um, some of the topics that came up that people were interested in. As influenced in the we have here today. So, I want to talk a little bit about what's going on uh, from the perspective of Ireland um, and cybersecurity risks and so on. And in, in a talk recently, I put forward these two kind of headlines and said, Well, which one do you want? Do you want Ireland to be a victim of all of this kind of cybersecurity and threat actors, or would you want to take advantage of this? And it's the same kind of messaging for a business. I mean, Businesses need to understand that cybersecurity is not a cost of investment, it's a competitive advantage. And it's what ensures your growth yeah, is to be able to enshrine under innovation good cyber risk management around that, because that is the competitive advantage. And that's where the whole area uh, uh, within the fin sector is so important, and those related sectors to that as well. So we, we see these really genuine headlines uh, from the geopolitical aspect of cyber actors, and we'll talk a little bit about Russia uh, on this as well, um, because this is real, and this is what's happening every single day, um, uh, uh, and they're not the only ones, but the ones we're going to focus on for the next few minutes. Um, and we see even from the point of view of Ireland being seen as a target from the point of view of our transatlantic cables and the internet into Ireland, and what's going on off our coast, uh, and do we have any protection? So we do not have a GCHQ, we do not have you know, a, a big uh, signal intelligence operation. We don't have, well, no military state that has all these capabilities to protect ourselves from these kinds of threat actors as well. So it's often down to how we design code, how we, we implement the systems, are, are going to be the difference between being a victim and not being a victim. And being able to provide assurance and being able to provide evidence to any potential customers of any systems that you're delivering is so, so important. Um, we see some of the biggest banks in Ireland being capable fines of over 20 million euros um, for not being able to prove 
their levels of site resilience. Not that they didn't have site resilience, they couldn't prove. So this is all about baking in cyber security, cyber risk management, GOC controls within FinTech and within any technology that's being created. And being able to be in a position where you can provide assurance and evidence and proof to people that you are taking cyber security seriously and you are able to mitigate the threats that are posed from that position. Um, I'll just play it shorter in the video here. What will happen after the slow of Boris Johnson on the answer to Russia? Вообще на Британских островах, похоже, заговаривается. Зачем грозить ядерным оружием без крайней России, сидя на, в общем-то, немаленьком острове? Остров столь мал, что лишь обремен один из самых местных начин, чтобы в его утопить раз и навсегда. Все лучше почти. Это всего лишь один вуз, Борис, а Англии нет. Раз навсегда. Зачем заигрываться? Другой вариант – погрузить Британию в морскую пучину в российский подводный робот-беспилотник «Посейдон». Он приближается к цели на километровой глубине со скоростью 200 км в час. Нет никакого способа остановить этот подводный дроб. Боеголовка на нем мощностью до 100 мегатон. Взрыв этой термоядерной торпеды у берегов Британии поднимет гигантскую волну – цунами высотой до 500 метров. Такой водяной шквал является еще и носителем экстремальных гостинцев, пройдя на британский. So you can see that this is part of the information we have heard that under Megaton, the nuclear weapon would land off the coast of Turkey, creating a tsunami, wiping out the whole left side of Europe, turning all those cells and so on like this. And although that's all propaganda and and with new cells, um, it's part of the disinformation and the kind of campaigns that we see going on all the time. And, the, and there's a grain of reality, to, obviously, to all of this. Uh, so um, this handsome chap is me when I have hair, because I used to live in Russia. Um, at age 20, I went to uh, live and work in Kazakhstan and Moscow and so on, and I worked with lots of different kind of agencies and, and, and corporations over there. So what I'm going to talk about isn't anti-Russia, because lots of Russian friends still, but certainly there's an element of anti-war about it. <laughs> what's going on from the threat action perspective. So I mentioned the fifth domain and cyber warfare. Um, I mentioned the, the 22 red lines and it's almost uh, understanding the arrangements that the, the two powers put together. But no one introduced it to a cyber threat action. So you can actually understand how all this comes together. Criminality, geopolitics, and the world we live in. Um, so this guy's called Vladimir Putin. And we love acronyms in IT, we love acronyms in cybersecurity. So when we start looking at some of this and start to say, well, what kind of threat actor is this guy? This guy's powerful, he's resourceful, he's innovative, he's cold, and he's hard. We refer to this guy as a brick. That's reality what we're dealing with, right? He's a significant threat actor. Uh, but where did he come from? So back in 1999, or thereabouts the late 90s, uh, when I was in, in, in Russia, we had. This gangster capitalism, which was effectively the, the Soviet Union was breaking down, uh, assets of, of Russia were being handed out to all these kind of oligarchs who were coming to the richest people in the world. And they decided uh, that they wanted to, to pick who was going to be the next president because they were so rich and so powerful. They owned all the wealth, they owned gas fields, all this kind of stuff. And you've got two of them here, um, and they were the kingmakers. They were going to decide who was going to take over from Yeltsin at the end of the day. And, and what happened was this unofficial understanding, which was, we don't really care about cyber criminals as long as they don't attack Russians. They can do whatever they want. But we do want a little backhand, and we do want them to do as favors every time we favors. So that's why all these criminal cells started getting supported, because they wouldn't be extradited. They wouldn't be a cooperation with law enforcement in, in other countries around the world. And that's why people were Russian hackers. There's lots of different kind of hackers that they work out of Russia. Um, uh, from, that, from that perspective, but we'll see how this came about. So we had Yeltsin, and Yeltsin was famously the president who was turning over, he was at the end of his tenure name, more ways than one. And they said, well, who are we going to get to replace her? And we want to put our puppet in, and we want to find out who that's going to be. So they uh, decided they'd fire a spin up. Um, and this guy, Paul Manfort here, was the uh, campaign manager for uh, Donald Trump. Um, he was subsequently arrested afterwards. Um, and he was the uh, one of the people involved, for example, who was trying to control the 
the, um, the government was coming to Ukraine and spin a lot of the messaging around that. So these birds of a feather kind of flock together on that geopolitical sphere of bad guys and bad actors and all this kind of stuff uh, that were working within those kind of political circles. Um, but I want to introduce you to this guy because the spin doctors that they engaged, they carried out all these kind of market research activities. And one of those market research activities was in newspapers, they put in surveys and they said, who would you like to be the next president? And they all came back overwhelmingly with this result and they said, we want Max Porter Van Stevens to be our next president after Yeltsin. And we've obviously all heard this guy, huh? So, Mike, <laughs> right? because this guy's a fictional character. He's the Russian James Bond. He's out of a TV program. So they all said, we want somebody who's like a spy, who's like a hired man, and, and that's what we want to put in place. So they looked around and they found this guy, Vladimir Putin, who's working with Stasi, working over Germany in Dresden. And they decided, we will take this guy, and we will ruin him, and we will, he will be our man, and we'll put him out. So in 1999, at the turn of the lane, the big party was on, they went out this guy. The Russians had no clue who he was, they had to see who this guy was. He was in an ill-fitting suit, he came out, he was shy, he was uh, awkward, everything else like that. He said, but this is going to be a new president. And this was a handover of power from Yeltsin to this guy, blessed by the oligarchs, organised by the oligarchs, and so on. And this is essentially what, what happened in that period. What they didn't realise, they thought they could control Putin, and they didn't, because all these oligarchs that were in so soon they got arrested by Putin, and so on. And, and, and the story goes on and goes on. So as ex KGB agent, we'll know from our movies what KGB are, the Secret Service, if you like, uh, within Russia, the, the old Russia US and so on. And uh, that became rebranded into, if you like, the FSB. And the FSB uh, is under the direct control of Vladimir Putin. And they run a signal intelligence agency known as the GOU. They operate under this tower in Moscow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, remember that elephant in you walk in, and depending on what part you come to, you see it's all the same thing. It's an elephant, but you think it's something different. You're going there. That's what we need to think of when we look at it from this element. So one of the things they set up was Unfortunately, acronym in the IRA, uh, well, the uh, Internet Research Agency, and they, they were also known as the Trolls from the They got 800 people and they trained them how to be trolls, how to blog, how to convince people to click on clickbait, how, how, things like neurolinguistic programming, some psychological approaches to already all those kind of things. And now they've got this mercenary unit that they could use for disinformation campaigns the elections in 2016 and so on in the United States, all those kind of things. They've had this resource they could use as part of books. And this is just one example of the kind of things that we do. Now, when we look about elephant in the room, all of these attacks, and many people go, oh, that was APT 28, or that was Sub Cafe, or that was this or the other. They're all the GRU. They're all this human that's controlled by Vladimir Putin. These are or, um, more famous kind of things. We've got Bad Rabbit, the World's anti doping Agency, Mount Petrick, uh, the Chemicals Watchdog, the DNC, Max. Every one of those has been attributed to the G or U. So the Operation Signal Intelligence part of the Russian state, which is controlled by Vladimir Putin. We're all very familiar with the ransomware attack on March 18th, and they took down the whole health sector during COVID. Um, and it was all to Russian hackers, full stop. Well, actually, it's a Russian hacking group that is very closely controlled uh, by Vladimir Putin. 180 million they turned last year with 62 staff. 3 million per staff from They're an amazing tech company, aren't they? To be able to do that kind of revenue. Um, on their website, and all of this is out in, in a wired uh, story uh, that you, you, you can find more about this. There's relationships between Putin and um, uh, uh, the, the country of Ansemar group. But what was really interesting, it was on February 28th when the Russians uh, went into Ukraine. And on that day, on the Consumers <coughs> website, they have a pride position of their latest target. And uh, HC was up there back when HC was attacked. And they say, our latest victim is this double. But on the 28th, they put up a message saying, Vladimir, you have our full support. Anything you need us to do on this, we will do it for you. Absolutely handy love working together on this area. So, are we dealing with a state attack on our health service, or was it criminals? So that's why all these blurred lines are always going to be there. We just need to know we're dealing with cyber evil at the end of the day. What are they going to it? So when we look at this, we, we, we essentially come to that conclusion we're dealing with bad actors. And whether we get caught up to finding something uh, pedantically, whether it's warfare, whether it's criminality, we're to be, it's something we need to be aware of. It's something we need to defend against and be able to deal with the risks of those things at the end of the day. So what can we do about this? 
Um, well, the key to all of this, um, I, I represent a set, uh, not for profit organization, uh, it's been employed years ago now, called the ICTTF, the International Social Task Force. And um, our mantra is it takes a network to defeat a network. So we need to do this as much as possible. We need to network, we need to share information, we need to help each other, because that's exactly what the bank does. They share information, they teach each other, they train, they support each other, and that's what we do. So the way to any problem is help or ask them to come in and help you. It's very deliberate to each other. So, um, so let's look at how we develop a cyber strategy. The first thing you need to do is understand what we're trying to protect. I was talking earlier to someone over the coffee break and said, um, it's amazing how times I walk into banks and I'll make a CISO back in the UK or something like that. I'll say, great, you're a global CISO for this bank. Um, how does the bank make money? I don't know. I think they do mortgages, they lend money to them. That's the depth of your knowledge on the trillion dollar of assets that you're protecting. You don't have any domain knowledge of what you're protecting. And that is what makes these million dollar sixes we're talking about. If you understand an industry, you understand the business, you're far more ahead than somebody who is way ahead on cybersecurity from that perspective. So it's, it's about getting domain knowledge on your business, how business operates, how the processes and so on. And that's what missing. So if you think of this like a pyramid, then at the bottom of the pyramid, with all the techniques, you've got the, the architecture that went off, with the system training the courses, you've got your firewalls, you've got all your stuff all down there. But as you move up this, it's the management sphere. We need legal people, procurement people, HR people, uh, people that actually run and operate businesses to become what I call business protection officers. They will have cyber knowledge to understand and to make cyber-based and space decisions when cyber. Um, run data analytics, from KPIs, from KRIs, all of those kinds of things. That's what's more important in many ways. But I think that's, that's what's missing. That's what the massive vacuum of the gap is in talent in the cybersecurity industry. Um, it's just simply not there. So understanding your business, because we look at this infographic up the top here, what we have is a business model. Every business has its unique business model. And no two banks are the same, no two bookshops are the same. They're all slightly different. And they're different because where they're located. If I have a bank and it's in Ukraine, it's a slightly different risk than a bank that's in Dublin because of the nature of the people are taking into account the intelligence, business intelligence, and the risk factor of operating from Ukraine. Um, but every business will have what we call business ICT requirements, business information communication technology requirements. So in other words, how do you use the cloud? How do you use apps? How do you use technology? That's how are you utilizing the internet? All of those things, it's unique for every business. And that will be driven by decisions and policy that's across all of that. And underneath that, depending on how you use technology, depending on where, depending on the amount of data and the type of data you're using, depends on the business, legal, and regulatory requirement charts. And this is one of the biggest challenges is in this space in cyber. Because, like I say, we're strong on the technical piece around cyber and technologies and all that, but we're getting so much to understand. Uh, what to do in the proofs of shoes to slam them over my and how do you transfer data legally? How do you make an organization work legally by transferring data from here to North America? Or the controls are different if you're going off to Eastern Europe or North Germany. How do you fall in with privacy laws, security laws, surveillance laws, all of those things? That's where the big challenge is. I mean, people understand the cloud based technologies, people understand the AI, machine learning. Um, how do you set policies within your bots and, and, and your artificial intelligence workers? Because it's one thing to train a human, but it's another thing to influence policy within a decision-making process within your life. It's a really different kind of challenge to deal with. So we need to align these two things. Yeah. Right? And at the same time, on the left-hand side, we have to consider we've got all these cyber threat actors, terrorists, criminals, all these kind of uh, bad actors and inside. On the other side, you've got the complication to the employees, suppliers, and business partners. What are they doing? Are they, are they lowering your game? Uh, are you really super strong on cyber? They're doing a really poor job, but yet you're interfacing. If COVID is false, one thing, we're all interconnected and interdependent, and certainly within the financial sector. And we see that through the guidance of G7 and so on. Uh, Christine McGarrett coming out pre COVID and saying a cyber attack on the financial uh, sector could cause a liquidity crisis. Very clever lady. Because that's the, the reality of it, because it's so interconnected in smaller pieces, and they are the, the key cogs that keep things going. So it's not just about SWIFT, and it's not just about the bigger pieces, it's about the smaller pieces and how that works as well. And it's the board's responsibility to have a strategy to do this. So, what firewall engineer can write a cyber strategy? It's a business thing. To understand things like governance, oversight, project delivery, what's important. I mean, to walk into someone who's the CISO of a bank, 
and they don't understand what the next five year plan for that bank is, how are they doing the job? They can't. Because you need to align everything you do inside what the, the business uh, plans are so that the board can monitor, evaluate, and direct the cybersecurity strategy. So I like simplicity. And I put this together from the point of view of looking at having your business and your cyber strategy in line. So if you're in a car and you want to go forward, you know those two wheels in line. If they're completely in line, you, you repeat with, with less resistance, fast, and you can progress with, with your business. And you can think of streaming wins or cyber governance and oversight and the chance of areas or cyber framework. So think of that picture when you think of piecing these things together. It's not just about the technology. It's about this piece and getting those right within the organization. So when I'm talking to the board, the bank, or the organization, that's what we're talking about. Because the, this piece is broken in most organizations. They don't have this. They think it's an IT problem. They think the tail should wipe the dog. How can the head of IT make risk-based decisions for an entire business? If they're on a budget of half a million or a million, they have a business with 200 million. How are they making all the risk-based decisions? They need to inform the board, empower the business leaders with metrics, with data analytics, real information that they can use to make these kind of decisions. And I'm, I say this challenge thing on our compliance, this is growing all of the time. Uh, one of the things we put together in our CTF is uh, an online set risk academy. And there's, there's a, a course that we call the certified set risk officer course. I mean, there's one logic that changes more than anything else. This law, compliance, everything. It's just changed so fast all of the time. Um, and some people love that area, and, and, and um, it, it, it's what they want to get into. Um, for others, they're just really, you know, but it's a, it's a, it's a quite more. And from a cyber related perspective, this is interesting about Russian sanctions and even sanctions on paying ransoms, <laughs> and the area that companies pay ransoms and all this kind of stuff. But now, the financial service industry has turned and said, well, you start paying ransoms, you start paying to any of these threat actors around the world, we're going to hit you with sanctions. This is a massive challenge. How do you deal with that? How do you manage that with technology? Where's the opportunity for you to create something in this space? This is the pain that organizations are facing in fast society, is dealing with this end of things. And it will get the attention of the board faster than I have the CBE level five when you get on fire with all kinds of world service and like that. This is where they want solutions in innovation, because this is just hard graft. And it's just changing to expand so much. There's not enough technology to help you. And when you look at this, you know, you've got business drivers there, not just in the SL2781, you have laws. So, what I decide to do to protect my business about it may not be legal in Germany, may not be legal in America, may not be legal in Russia, for example, um, because of um, there's lots of different reasons, but some of them are historic. If you look at the views of some countries will take on privacy as they go in the world, the difference in the view of data protection and privacy in North America versus Europe and human rights privacy and so on. These are the fundamental characteristics that make it a challenge, and there isn't enough technology out there to help businesses deal with this space. I can tell you that there just isn't. Um, and every organization is somewhere in the middle here of, of trying to comply with understanding what do I need to comply with? Am I compliant to it? Am I operating legally? Am I waiting on a regulator or a third party or a stakeholder or business partner coming in all at me and telling me that you're not operating legally and you can't deal with it anymore? Or you're going to have to, to, to really pay on an SLA fund or whatever it wants to be. So it's a big space. This is a little bit more in depth. I won't, won't, won't drag this down too far on this, but um, the business will have a vision, that vision will have a mission, that mission will have goals, a numerous goals. Um, and out of that, you have key objectives and you have outcomes. And generally, those outcomes are going to be things like value preservation, value creation. That's what business wants to do preserve value, create value. So, having that aligned, um, all of you are going to have tactics on how to do this from a cybersecurity point of view. Um, break it down into key actions, that all ends up, ends up being a cyberless framework. Here's what I want to emphasize that all made up of controls. Now, what every organization wants to know, they do not want someone coming into the field and saying, our security is good. Um, the big four were in, they said, we're 3.5 out of 5. So what? That's all you hear visit leaders' minds when you start talking about that in subjective terms. They want data. They want analytics. They don't want subjective. They want something like that is qualitative that they actually uh, uh, point to. So what we're talking about here is residual risk. So if you have inherent risk in your business, inherent risk is based on your cyber DNA, how many people you have, where you operate from, what kind of data you've got, how much data you've got, what sector you're working with. All these things that data wants to make up your inherent level of cyber risk. It's the risk minus the impact of any controls against you. Okay? So you don't take into consideration the firewall or antivirus or anything. You don't have risk. Then you put your mitigations in place. You know, consult your editor. 
That gap, that's residual risk, residual cyber risk. That's what the business needs to understand. Because they want to understand what's my cyber residual risk in rolling out project A, project B, business line C, whatever it wants to be, because that's what they want to treat. They don't want a cybersecurity professional coming in and saying, I can make this the most secure company in the world, even if you're doing it. They don't care. They want to understand what they need to do and why they're doing it. And it's really important to be able to pinpoint these kind of metrics and then be able to report them to the board in the right way. So if you're in an ideal situation, you're able to go to uh, a board or a business leader and say, you're rolling out in the banking app next week and your residual risk on is this. Now, what are your choices? Accept the risk, mitigate the risk, transfer the risk. You're giving them a risk management decision now. You're not giving them a, I listen to the EV brand, let's buy some more technology and everything's going to be okay. That's the illusion of cyber security. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that as we go on. So the wonderful world of CORQ, cyber risk qualification, metrics, data analytics, it's in an infantile space at the moment. So if any of you are innovators and technologists and so on, this is a space where really people need to be focusing on creating tools and solutions in FinTech, RedTech, and sure they all that all around this kind of space because there's not enough good boys in this space. Because the leadership challenge is how to empower leaders. Leaders make entrepreneurs a risk factors and they make risk-based decisions all day long. They end up running businesses and enterprises where they decide to so How do you empower them? You empower them with information, inform them with good knowledge. And that has to be something where if you do a clicker, it makes sense that there's, there's science behind the metric. It's not something where uh, we're good or a vendor said that this is the right way to do it. They need to understand and it needs to relate back to the business and the cyber DNA. If, you, if you're going into a board of directors and you're talking about Microsoft told us we need to do this, then we'll be secure. You've lost. If you're going to be saying, I understand next year we're going to run out this, this is really important for the business. And I've identified some risk around the technology and the platform, and they said, here's your choices. I mean, X million dollars to fix it. You'll get the support or we'll accept the risk. And what you're actually creating is really clever. You're creating what's called one man governance event. It can't be ignored. You're no longer just a techie person or something like that coming in and talking about problems, wanting more money, more digital things. You're giving them a business risk based decision and they have to make a decision based on that. Um, and they love simplicity. They love traffic like reports. But I much prefer red or green so you can just go and listen. This is good, but this is bad. And you won't accept that because there's no inflation so a library dead. No, no library dead. So, um, and that's what you face this. So that's the security illusion I talked about. And that's one of the big problems here. We have often done in analyzed organizations, and you will see that they're spending hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars on controls. And from a church perspective, these controls might be the level five in the church, but they don't have baseline controls. 80, 90 percent of attacks and hacks are based on the absence of failure. Genesis is a baseline control. Did you have patching in place? Did you have policies? Do people know what to do? Do they know not what to do? All those kind of things. And they're the gaps. But those gaps are not sexy. Those gaps are not interesting. They're technologists. You want to play with technology. You want to innovate. You want to break. So all of the focus tends to move that higher than the stuff. But really, you're overshooting the mark a lot of the time. And if you think you're going to scale one to five, I can tell you that most organizations agree, and they're spending all the money at level four and level five, but the risk is only level three. And they have with a massive delta where controls on level one. And they're, they're not that. That's every day in every business, large, small, uh, uh, and the way it works. And it gets back to this what's the likelihood uh, by impact? That's what the risk is, and that's what the business needs to understand. So you need to communicate, you need to convert, you need to translate, and, and all of those kind of things into business language. Because the cybersecurity industry is called up in acronyms, it's called up in technical terms, it's called up in machismo. I've mentioned a few times the lack of uh, uh, women in the industry uh, because it's a boys industry and it's a boys industry of, oh, let's talk about acronyms the whole time and have a good sound off about who's most technical in the real world kind of stuff. That doesn't work in the real world business and so on. It's about actually understanding what's important for the industry and those softer skills of actually communication, dealing with things holistically. Um, but one of the most fascinating things when we set up the, the Certified Service Service course was, um, and the reason we set up the Service Group Book Group Care for Women was simply women were better at Service Security and Service Response. We like that we were far better at it holistically than anything else, and that's why we created Group Care for Women, and it's taken off hugely uh, as a consequence. Um, and for whatever reason, I'm sure there's a bit of experience to me, why they're very much different. Um, they're, the technique is just single stream, not a focus, all that. 
Well, dealing with psychological and cybersecurity, you need to be holistic and you need to be considering what all the things that go on uh, around the impact. So, this is a balancing act, guys. What is the environment, what are the controls in place when attacking the bosses, people, technology, and so on? And what are the controls that I have in place? Have I got the balance right? If I don't have the balance right, that's my cyber residual risk. Now, let's look at the top of the cybersecurity board. So, culture. What does culture mean to you in an organization? Culture comes from policy. So who decides what the policy is? All policies go through a procedure known as TRAP. Create, review, treat, report. <laughs> but when it comes to human behavior and culture within an organization, it has to come from leadership. The only answer to cyber is leadership. We need to empower leaders, give them the right kind of information, and let them to be able to set the policy, set the agenda, and that trickles down into the culture of an organization. This is the same for a country, whether we're talking to, to here about a certain country, we need a technical, social approach to security. We can't, as individual consumers, if we're hacked, blame the bank if we didn't have the patches on the phone. We have a responsibility to, to update our phones, to update our laptops and devices. You can't just point at something. We all play a part in cyber hygiene. Again, a bit of a you know, relationship with COVID, it's equivalent to washing hands. Cyber hygiene, yeah. mask, all those kind of things. We all play a part in dealing with the risk uh, that's associated. Um, I touched upon a little bit there about ethics and uh, moral compass and those kind of areas because, with a lot of this, because of the lack of skills, we tend to automate as much as we can in the world of cybersecurity, which is a good thing. But as long as you understand is the policy affecting what you're automating and the decision making, the pieces from machine learning, AI, and those people as well, because that itself is a massive challenge. On how to, how to <laughs> and at the end of the day, people are a major attack vector. If they can't get through the firewall, they're going to try and through the human. And whether that's one of the biggest things that the industry should the moment is what's called the romance scan. And what they'll do is they'll take six months, maybe eight months, to build up a relationship with you online and let you fall in love with them. And you fall in love with an entity that, that you feel is real, they've reached out to on LinkedIn or whatever social media platform you're on, and they build this relationship that they'll be on dating sites about anything. They, they, they will take their time, they're not in a rush, they're not looking for you to send them $10 or something like that. And they build up this relationship, a real relationship that you've invested your heart into. And then they will turn around and say, actually, um, I'm the one who's been on, and I have that video, or oh, I have these things, yeah, they, these, these laws that are meant to me. Unless you cooperate, you know, this is what's going on. And now they have their guy inside the bank, or inside the organization. This happens in technology companies, this happens in banks, and being asked that. They were used for human frailties and human weaknesses against themselves as well, afraid to go the wrong way. Um, they, they, they will misappropriate trust. And trust is the most important thing. Everybody has a different view of trust. Trust is that human emotion that makes you vulnerable. If you trust something, you're vulnerable to it. The ultimate trust in the world is love. So you can take twins, same DNA, but have a different view of trust. It's, it's the most amazing root product, but it's what we're trying to all do in fintech and in technology is create this house trust online instantly. Let them trust my website, let them trust my app, let them trust those they And that's why cyber security is so important in instilling and supporting a concept of trust online. So, do you remember when I was going to say, do you remember airports? Most people go back in airports at this stage. But if you walked into an airport and you saw a long attendant back, there's something visceral in your limbic brain that kicks off and goes, hmm, that's all right. You know? Uh, what are we going to do there? And you put your hand up, you take responsibility and say, just be really, hey, there's a bag over there. I don't like the look of it, but just something like that. And that's what you need in your employees at every staff member. I don't think working in a company, that's why I don't think we're going to protect your organization. If everybody feels they're playing a part in responsibility, it's loyalty we want in our compliance. And why is it too addictive to take a picture it's training. Loyal to them is they care, and they care about the business, um, which is really important. Um, and setting policy to go beyond the compliance. Compliance will always be the minimum, minimum baseline. If you look at something like even the junior legislation, it's updated. Uh, before it was updated, Facebook didn't exist, the cloud didn't really exist, none of these things really exist. It's always going to be way behind, and it's a minimum. And to win to organizations who are using that as their target, being compliant doesn't make you secure. It just means you find it with a minimum baseline regulation, so don't be on that. So we say that with cyber risk, you don't measure it, you can't manage it. That's why I think there's a lot of opportunities for, for those in the English room around this, this kind of space, about being able to measure and get to understand cyber risk and get to control within the applications and, and, and uh, um, the, the, the various solutions that we involved in the world. Uh, 
the World Economic Forum has said the first thing you need to do is do an assessment, understand where you are. So you must understand where you need to be. So again, assessing your cybersecurity levels right across the organization, finding the line, people, processes, the technology, understanding those gaps and what your target level should be. So then you will understand what, what are the proper controls to have in place. And those proper controls will be upstream and downstream within the organization. Sorry, upstream and downstream within the organization because we don't operate on alone. So you, you, you could secure your organization, and let's say you have an 80% score, an 85% score, something like that, but you're dealing with suppliers on a 20% score. Well, that's very much in your, your presence if you need to connections between these. Um, you're not on the same page. So how do you fix that? You fix that with good communication, trust between modes to say, I'm not afraid to say we're not perfect. Um, everybody, you know, one, one of the weirdest things about cyber security and cyber crime and cyber victims is we blame the victim. If someone scammed you, it's crazy Paul coming out honestly and just saying, Paul, I was scammed. That's very honest, most people don't. Um, and we blame the victims of cyber you know, and we go, oh, you're so stupid, you're from me. I've clicked on this. You know, we, we trust our phones, these devices, we sleep up inside our heads at night time. You wake up where we like to kick and something. They're very clever threat actors we're trying to get through. Some mistakes will happen. But could you detect it? Could you respond? Could you recover it? That's what, what is so important for organization to be able to do. But the blaming the victim piece, it's uh, we've done talks about this tonight, like, it's like sex crime, we're blaming victims of sex crime, but it's ridiculous, it's a crime. And the victim is a victim, whether it's a business or an individual, and we need to be able to have a support mechanism as well. And it's me today, you tomorrow, it's a mentality on the most of cyber security. Um, and a lot of this legislation that I've talked about has a mandatory breach notification. There's a piece coming in from the EU called DORA, Digital Operations Resilience Act. Um, you'll have hours of truth watching incidents. You'll find something 1% of your global turnover per day to your clients. That's going to be law in Ireland for the 18 months, 18 months, 18 months. It's been passed by Europe. DORA, Digital Operations Resilience Act. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a real game changer because what it's saying is all the financial services and their supply chain. And for the first time ever, the regulator will regulate the major IT suppliers to the industry. They will be able to find the other this. Now, in every other country, there's a cybersecurity organization that will inform you about all of these things. But we have a very poor effort in keeping us up to date with what's coming from Europe and what we should be aware of. Door is passed, it's on its way here, there's one, it's also the critical entry to the resilience act. Uh, there's also a NIS D2, the NIS Directive 2 Network Information Systems uh, Directive Number 2 is coming around. All of these things have a major breach notification, major impact on our financial services companies, and it's the thought when your clients have. Because this is coming to their way and go, what are we doing with this? Even the last couple of weeks, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the NIST side security program. It's different from NIS D, it's N I S T from the NIST uh, Technology. Uh, uh, Standards Organization in America. I'll talk a little bit about it all because what we've seen is they've now got the baseline substitute standard for all public sector in Ireland based on that. So we're seeing some movements towards this, um, which is, is pretty good. So let's look at some of the other small sites. What do leaders need to do? How can they go about doing this? Well, let's look at this leader on what he did. He, Barack Obama, put out executive order 13636 in 2013 because he was responsible for the United States of America, the economy, their business partners and relationships all around the world, he's effectively the CEO of the United States of America in 2013. He said, well, what do we need to do? And they decided they would work at academia, industry, and technology clubs to create a framework and an approach to managing cyber risk and organizations, but it should fit everybody. No matter what sector you are, no matter what social organization. And they call it the NIST cyber security framework. The good news is it's free. And the good news is that it's become probably the standard in 90% of assessments and organizations throughout the world. Uh, and in the financial sector, whatever you're looking at, whether it's an ECB or any other organization, you'll find even reverse engineers in countries back to the NIST cyber security framework because most have driven from this framework. So we look under the hood, it's made up of three pieces. We have a core implementation tiers and profiles. So the core is how it actually operates. We have the implementation tiers of kind of like maturity levels of sure we have tier one, tier two, tier three. So depending on the organizations you're working with, it might be tier one, it might be tier two, tier three, that was sweet. And then you have the profiles. So your profile might be an existing status profile, then you have a target profile of what you're trying to get. Um, 
we have one at multiple map. Five levels, identify, protect, detain, respond, and cope with these are the function areas. If you think of the simplicity of that, identify what I'm going to protect, can it protect it, can it respond, can it cope? You know, we're going to be able to work on my way through uh, from an organization point of view. This is what it looks like, where you create your functions, you create your categories, your subcategories, and what's called informative reference. Informative references are those references in other standards and frameworks around the world, like ISO 27201, uh, like COVID, those kind of frameworks and standards. So it's pointing here. So it talks about the outcome that you try and have, and how do you get that outcome? You go and look at formal reference. That's what COVID looks like. So you, you can implement these things um, concurrently rather than consecutively. Um, and I'm just wanting to let your appetite with this because also this is my whole NIST training, training course, but wet your appetite as, as they go to when you look at these core functions, they're so basic in the approach of what you're trying to do. What processes and asset cleaning protection? What safeguards are in place? What techniques can identify the incidents? What techniques can contain the impacts of the incidents? What techniques can restore capabilities? Now Quick side on this. If, if, if 10 years ago we were talking about this, the talk would all be about how we can how we can protect you when we know we can't. But the reality is we've always said we will become victims of attacks and maybe successful breach of the time. So now it's about cyber resilience. Cyber resilience is what I know for the time. Could I respond and could I recover? And that's why the ECB has the minimum expectations of cyber resilience. For those of you working in the, the fintech space, uh, or based on the homepage, because it is the most important thing for every financial service organization in the world. It's being able to prove your own cyber resilience. Talked about an Irish bank carrier all that they find they were trying to meet because they couldn't prove it. Of course, the cyber was able to allow them, but they didn't prove it, and uh, weren't able to prove it uh, a level of that. So, we look at this as a translation there in the business. You've got senior executives, you've got specialists in different areas within your organization. And then you have your implementation people around cybersecurity, IT, and controls, and all those kind of things. This acts as a translation there between them, because you get on the same page. You go back to that, that, that graphic of putting the table together and the test together, you want it within the same page. You can't have a scenario where one team is working on GDPR, the other team is working on, on business continuity, the other team is working on seeing privacy legislation, you've got an ISO 2701 team, and you've got an IT security team. You can't have that. There's no efficacy there. There's no efficiency whatsoever. You need to get them all on the same page. All on the same page. This is a great way of doing that. Um, and it's big. So this is when you start pulling it apart and starts to kind of look really cool and technical. That's what it looks like. It really means rather simple and straightforward um, on, on, its, on its approach and, and how it works. But it covers everything uh, that you, you think of in an organization. Implementing an organization is a risk-based approach. Now, so we would eventually, as I say, cybersecurity doesn't exist. Okay, cyber it means anything on the internet, anything technical, devices, data flows, that's cyber. Okay, security means breaking risk. So I argue that you can't use the internet and you can't have cyber because there's no such thing as 100 percent secure unless it's closer to get people to move you. There's no such thing as 100% secure. Well, then there is no security. It's not a goal we get to. It's about risk management. It's about setting certain levels of risk and identifying those levels of risk and being able to monitor those in the same way. Nothing is perfect in any business. It's going to be risk management based decisions. So, the art of this is to get your head out of cyber security, get into cyber risk management, because there is no such thing as 100% security. Everybody will agree with you on that. So there just isn't something, anything you have to do with resources and things. And when you do with people and processes and technology, nothing is 100% secure. So, it's about how you manage the risk around certain products, certain systems, uh, certain innovations, and so on. So um, this gives you uh, an implementation plan, this is straight uh, from the framework itself, on how you implement and manage that risk as it's changing in the organization. You have to get out of the mentality of IT projects that get delivered and finished. Cyber risk management is a journey, not a destination. So you're continually working on the threat landscape is changing, the innovation within your company is changing, the priorities are changing, and it's about getting all that in, in play as it goes through. Now, I mentioned these million dollar jobs, right? Um, so I, I, uh, I want to talk a little bit about those and why it's so important because this is where innovation comes in as well. Just take my time, let's move on. Um, so these are cuttings from newspapers and online ads that we've been on for, for many years about these million dollar jobs because, quite frankly, they exist. 
Um, many banks have to wait two or three years before they can attract a chief inflation superior. So it's not just in the financial sector, it's in, um, uh, for example, Palaue at the moment are looking for a, a seven figure C settle in Belgium. These jobs are everywhere, right? Because finding someone that has a domain knowledge and understands the business and then also understands cyber risk, that's the goal. Isn't it? Not just someone who's just cyber security because they're much easier to get than someone that actually understands business. So finding someone that is an expert in procurement or an expert in legal governance, risk, or banking or technology innovation or project management, these are the roles when they're wrapped with cyber security skills and augmenting with cyber risk skills. So a lot of organizations want it's that top end of the period. That's where all of those those really lucrative uh, jobs are going. And right all the way up to the board and you have um, uh, board level cyber net, cyber non executive directors, and you can small fortunes and so on like that, and uh, to be able to these organizations. And there is tons of backers. But this is why, but this is a quick kind of, I don't know what we're leaving at the time, but let's have a quick kind of sum of this, um, some of the roles of the CISO, Chief Professional Security Officer. They're dealing with security architecture, project delivery, business enablement, and budget, security operations, risk management, identity management, legal and mutual compliance laws. Is that one person? Because in most organizations, that's a CISO office. But in some organizations, you need an individual that can work in all of those areas where it comes to And quite honestly, those people need to be excellent communicators, politicians, people, people, because they're the ones that get there. They're able to walk in and deal with techniques, they're able to walk into the board, they're able to walk in and have a near to that. Presentation skills are as important as understanding how to hire and fire the so those kind of skills are the skill set to build up the profile. But we've probably broken it down and we're we'll operating some really training. We're very good to form the commands of CISOs so to be able to take on the career paths to get there around that. So my strong message to organizations is that the answer is actually well within the organization. There is a speed of reaction that can try and outsource a lot of this stuff and they go, oh, we get inside the security company. And I say this as somebody who owns a cyber advisory group. But the reality is, is that most consultants come in and then they pick the brains of all the individuals in the organization to get the answers and to be able to, to pass them back to the clear to them. Uh, and they, those answers like they so empowering the workforce with the appropriate level of knowledge, the micro credentials, that time you can look on the side of the you see some of those courses um, and empower the people so they can empower the leadership and support the business with its objective. So I think that's probably a good sign for me to uh, follow holes and see the very time there for a few questions. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, that was a tremendous presentation, Paul. Thank you so much. Very reflective, very innovative, and I think at times very chilling. And I suspect for everybody in their organizations, cyber risk management or cyber resilience now is probably number one on your agenda. Um, one of the, I suppose, uh, fortunate things today is that we have a uh, great opportunity of bringing an expert on board to download all of the information on something that's very close to our hearts, which is flu crime or cyber security. And the reason why we did that was because we want to try and ensure that we can create master classes for organisations <coughs> within our region so that we can better ourselves working together. And one of the things in ATU that we're doing at the moment is we're creating a brand, FinTech Learning Labs, whereby we can engage with you as a strategic partner to try and ensure that we come together more often than not, so that we can discuss together all of the latest trends that are coming down the tracks. And those latest trends, in my opinion, will be, I suppose, delivered through master classes. So between now and we'd say the end of the year or quarter of one next year, I want to engage with all of the companies here today to try and ask you to become a strategic partner with us in the learning labs. So I just wanted to air that one or two points today. So that was the second reason why we're having a masterclass today. Once again, Paul, it's fantastic. I'm going to open to the floor in relation to questions, but to give you um, a minute or two to think about a question, I've invited Tim Kelly and Rosalind Smith, Tim from TCS and Rosalind from Fintrum, uh, to ask Paul a couple of questions, but I have one question first sure. I'd like to ask. And it's just the early hours this morning, I saw FTX trade, uh, a cyber, uh, sorry, a cryptocurrency exchange robust. And I'm wondering now, is fib crime a huge 
uh, a problem for s cryptocurrencies going forward because of the lack of regulation and the, I suppose, the, the hidden darkness behind cryptocurrencies. Yeah, and not just cryptocurrency exchanges. Gaming platforms are, are the, the one that's being uh, hit at the moment for money laundering because they support microtransactions and are not regulated. So the bad guys have turned to gaming platforms to launder their money. So they will find wherever it is, whether it's exchange, whether it's anything that's unregulated, is blood in the wall for criminals because they're in, it's easier to get in there and try and do these things. So we've seen a lot of that kind of activity over the, the last number of years around the, the cryptocurrency exchanges, fake ones, wallets being hit, exchanges going down, all those kind of things. Um, but anything that's innovative, that's not regulated, and can transfer value digitally is a target for criminals. Okay. So, uh, and that's a cryptocurrency exchange, but it's also online gaming or anything like that, where, you know, I'm online and I'm in the game and I'm buying a store for $5 and pass it over. They'll put $50,000 in a credit. And a lot of these could just actually turn a blind eye to this, but there are more um, morally mature organizations that are getting ahead of the upcoming regulations that may come into that sector, which is always great to be ahead of the curve. So, we, Sort of so, from the cyber resilience point of view, you don't, you don't think cryptocurrency will ever be regulated? Um, I, 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 from a resilience perspective, there's just manage it. There's a tacit regulation from the point of view of anybody we're dealing with. In, in, you know, so from the central bank model, there's more guidance going in, for example, here in Ireland, or what can be done, what can be done, and everything else like that. But a rising tide is all boats. Right. So if we're all doing cybersecurity better and cyber resilience better, then everybody ends up doing better because they have to. So whatever those exchanges are dealing with, and it goes over the They're forced, for example, Dora, I mentioned Dora. Dora will force you to take leap responsibility for everything you're dealing with to raise your, your level of security and to be able to understand the level of security. So if any bank or any third party organization is dealing with a currency exchange, um, they will have that knock on effect, that positive knock on effect to make sure that they're bringing the security to the level. But everything is the target. Then. So it's, it, you know, at the end of the day, the lack of regulation makes it easier for bad actors to operate internally in those kind of organizations, as well as external threat actors to those organizations. Um, or, you know, lots of stories that are fake exchanges and so on being set up, and uh, fake currencies and all those kind of things that people fall for. It's funny, the news came out this morning and the whole uh, cryptocurrency yeah. exchange has collapsed. Yeah. Anyhow, I thank you very much, Paul. I hand you over to. Rosalind, perhaps you might have a question for Paul. Make it easy. I <laughs> so, um, one, I guess, with your question, but I want to first of yeah. all, because I know you've a lot of experience and that was fascinating, so thank you very much for the whole presentation. Um, I guess from my point of view, these guys have been banking for years and years and years, so I've got very traditional think around uh, yeah. in the investment rights for most of the biggest banks in Wall Street are with them, certainly. Um, so these are most of our clients, I will say, yeah. which you've fleshed up pictures yeah. of. Do you think we've gone too far in facilitating what we always know one for, um, it being, you know, the oligarchs have gone to wealth through non, yeah. not through these but yeah. in way? We've been banking them for years and saying it's okay, they're all at it and all the banks are banking them. Do you think we've already lost the involvement with those guys? And also, I personally think we didn't do enough with the whole Remedy thing. Yeah. You know, it was four or five, six years ago, and <coughs> now they come back in for a bigger slice of the pie. Do you, are you on that way of life? I, 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 I want that way of life, to be honest with you, because I mean, I think there's kind of when people are doing well, it's something to turn a blind eye to a certain degree. You know, if you walk around London, we see affluence. Bond and all the rest of the kind of people doing that, whether, whether it's a legal firm, whether it's a banking firm, or whatever, there's all of this kind of um, inherited success yeah. from the bad guys. And turning your, your, you should be turning a blind eye to the obvious. If they were drug dealers, it may be more obvious. Yeah. But they're bad actors who've done something to murder their country. It, 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 it sort of blends itself into things like ESG as well. Because you have that whole model, and I, I, I did a talk about the song and the morality of a lot of this stuff about the decision making um, that, that people make around cyber security and controls and something like that. But if people turn the blind eye to them and go, oh yeah, they haven't technically broken a rule, but technically on this, the, the moral high ground circuit lost, heavy with the GDP record of humans. That's what's going on this as well. There's people who become more powerful, the more successful they become. So, kind of creating a monster. 
um, in, in, in many ways. And they will just buy up companies and show people when, when you're trying to move against them. I mean, I'm dealing with Senator Crowell at the moment, we're trying to build a resilience in Ireland around cyber security, and he's just been put on basically ship it. Um, he's not allowed to fly to Russia, he's not allowed to do anything, anything else. So if you put your head up, you really can be a target all the time. And those the, and then they're, they're, they they do a thing called compromise. Um, more on some people this because compromise is a good term that compromise and they will do a disinformation campaign on you and they will create a whole story of narrative on you. So this leads into things like you talk about Trump and the PP test and all this kind of stuff. Like it's just non-stop. If it was in a movie you wouldn't watch it because it's too far fetched. Right, but it's actually the reality of the world we're in. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, I think we've lost them all around uh, on it. Um, and trying to bring in sanctions now, a lot of this stuff, it's, it's, it's a bit too late. And he's been right to the banks as well, with the city on the set, and we have the city wall, and yeah. a lot of the landlords have to do the banks to your rent and we're not going to bank you, is nearly impossible, you know, yeah. you know it's difficult. Second question then yeah. is more around, um, and as Steve spoke a bit about compliance, and obviously I'm. When I started compliance 20 years ago, I was the modern compliance officer. I wasn't an ex lawyer or an ex auditor. I was in one of the first um, compliance grants games in the city of London. So to me, I was like the modern person then. I knew nothing about this world. I'm fascinated by it. Do you see the future MMROs who have the responsibility for the firm policy being much more cyber savvy, tech savvy? It's going to, it's going to need to be, I take it. Yeah, so one of the first things we did when we created our, our, our service for the training program, so service training program for cyber services, we partnered with the International Compliance Association, who trained all the AI people all over the world because of that connection. <coughs> These pathways are all converging. If you're going to go to the AI now, you to the compliance because of all of those elements. And that sort of relationship of hopping can just be into your skill set that's required but by, by so many. Um, so it, it's definitely something I encourage people to do. You get better at your job with compliance and you understand why you need to find certain controls and why you're so important. I mean, what we try and still in, in the training to do as well is why you should care. Because you know if you're in compliance so long, sometimes it's kind of to go, it's a have to do, it's a burden. So, when you realize that there's a real reason in general, it's to stop. One of the, the graphics that you can have up there around that cyber threat actors is what I call cyber scum. It's the people who uh, prey and target children and all the do that because they don't upset me. But I start going into those things um, and explaining what actually goes on and how these people who launder the money and transfer the money um, are making smart moves with small children and stuff like this. So, this is the reality of the dark world of why I call cyber evil, not being. You know, and we're all here or, or trying to exaggerate with humanity about it. It's a horrible dark world. And it might be cool in the movie, but when people are working in compliance, they're on the fifth one, they're on the beach, they're fighting against this, disrupting this, stopping this kind of activity. It's so important. But if people think lots of compliance are something they don't have the motivation. That's why I try to get into that piece about loyalty, and people caring and understanding. And why the most important thing to protect your business and compete inside your business. They care and love your money. So it's that you can keep defending more than some external consumers that have been for a couple of weeks and then disappeared, said the invoice. That kind of stuff. So I think it's that responsibility of these people who say, oh, well, tennis wasn't. Thank you, Roger. Tim. <coughs> Thanks for the talk. So um, let's touch a little bit on trends, right. specifically public private partnership trends. Right. Leases do it there. That legislation is coming through. Biden has his second round going through this year, and it creates a, a blunt instrument, right? Initially, into yeah. that finance, and the U.S. is trying a specialization route in terms of different regions responsible for different areas, and then private companies coming in and filtering from a technology point of view or from a service point of view, you know, creates a problem, right? As much as it creates a solution. And on the one hand, it's good. On the other hand, as we said earlier, you can't see everything all the time. Companies like TCS have a footprint in most of that. Customers all over the globe operating managed services, platform services, every cloud, private cloud, public cloud, hybrid, you name it. So if you suck that back in from a technology map point of view, you'll know that a lot of those technologies are US based. Right? So what's happening from a PPP point of view and a kind of a soft 
almost private network posse point of view, is that a lot of these technology partners are taking it on to enforce interdiction, evasion, cross the board, right? So that creates a problem contractually for multinational companies. The question, it's not simple, but how do we avoid that without everybody going to a private cloud, right? Because as all this gets nationalized from a data footprint, the banks and everyone else will say, well, you know what? I can't afford technology companies to pull a lever and say, pull out of all these agreements, I want to shut down until they join It's not possible. So we'll all go to private cloud, and then we'll have the same problems. So maybe one, touch upon the evolution of public-private partnerships, and two, some of those dependencies from a technology point of view and enforcing that kind of kinetic cyber warfare from individual positions like U.S. governments. Okay, so stop it there. So from, from the point of view of direct like harmonization of the challenge that we have, um, even 10 years ago, we talked about cloud and snow and these revelations came out. From Edward Snowden, people going, Whoa, it's there, it's looking at everything. Why do you care? Uh, those conversations are still going on, where people are afraid of the territorial view of where the data is. And we saw this even with uh, the change in GDP legislation, which is still in play when you, you, you look at Max Schreck. And I was talking to Max Schreck about four or five weeks ago uh, on this. And for those of you who don't know, Max Schreck is a student, Austrian student, who wrote to the uh, Data Protection Commission in charge of Facebook around this Facebook piece. Uh, that has gone on for a decade and more, uh, to the point that the laws have all been changed in relation to uh, is it legal to transfer a data over to the United States of America? Um, and effectively, it's not. There are certain controls and, uh, that are really only available to really high end companies who put in place. And then what do you do? If all of a sudden Facebook is operating legally, what do you do? You, you know, where, where does that go? Because that could be a bank, that could be anything else like that. So that's why I think this approach we've taken by the likes of ANISA and EU, there's a whole heart and soul harmonization in the approach. They're going, it's not too messy, right? There's too much noise, I think. Let's just not agree on one thing. That's why I'm a big advocate of this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, just let's make it simple so we can all understand that, like, you know, and there doesn't have to be 50. And, and it's a thing we call the nexus of controls. Um, it's like somebody coming in and doing an ISO 27001 or then a cloud compliance or like then a GDPR or asking the same thing in a different way. So understanding that nexus controls are across that is where the efficacy comes in and where that 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 is. And that's why it's holistic, taking a holistic approach rather than silo. So that whole debate around what's going on with public partners, um, people being now afraid to go into public cloud because all of a sudden overnight something can change. And realistically, can and, and it changes drastically. They're kind of risk based decisions then for boards to make strategically about what, what's going to happen in the known environments, whether they want to have their own private clouds available as well. And that debate's going on in boardrooms everywhere. And from the server room to the boardroom, have to engage to have that meaningful conversation um, about that. Um, I think the reality is technology answer is easier than the compliance and regulation. This is like hard part. It really is, right? Because that affects policy. And then people who are down in the nuts and bolts of technology, they can only do what policy says they can do. And then that's an easier play because they, they must have any partners they have to work with. So that, that's where a lot of that challenge is it, it, it. It's going to be around that, that space. And the leadership, in my experience, is not there in governments to do that. So therefore, you're relying on really good companies like TCS and so on that actually lead the space and say, actually guys, we understand the space and you should do this. And there are some good providers there that actually are genuinely involved in this space. And they're like, yeah, actually that's the issue really stuff. And I think that's the best play for people to own. If you're waiting on, for example, the Irish government just you know, it's just not going to happen. And I'm not bad about the moment, I'm very proud of the but it's the reality of it. And when we look at these big tech companies up here, I can tell you that the clients are like, and they're going, and they're not relying on, on guard shoot corners to protect them from cyber criminals. Right? They're not relying on that. They have their own resources, private resources, but also the Secret Service, also the FBI, also everything else, they want to bring national storage, everything else. Now. But if you're an indigenous business in Ireland, even a very, very successful, maybe airlines, um, you don't have that's the mechanism that other countries have in place to help you. You don't have a GCHQ, you don't have intelligence units and things like that, you're on your own. 
And it's enough for a fight, as I say, especially if there's state actors involved and so on like that. Um, and it means that it's even harder and, and more risky to operate businesses in that environment here. And why you need to find good partners to work with, whether it's TCS or whatever. So you, you need to find really good partners who are subject matter experts. And I'll probably get a kick to this, but not accountancy firms. <laughs> Just it drives me mad, right? When you know, people go to smart technology first to get the technology advice or decide security advice and stuff like that, because they tend to be this well, plan to go to those and make a why do you want to work here? I'm the sort of risk management, some sphere of innovation, technology, or digital transformation. I just thought I'll never get to right? So that's going to come off, like, off the court of voice on that. You know, but, you know, you feel the pain, I feel the pain with that whole piece around. Um, but that's why like things like door, understanding door, there's nothing else you look at door of the door, uh, door of the digital operation to the site. That is clever, right? Because that's like, let's get rid of all the mess. Let's have something really simple that we can all do, and there has to be a big stick. Compliance isn't about anything if there's no big stick with it. And that's a big stick with this thing. One for safety of all the truth on the great day, to be compliant. Do you have to move your compliant with it? But imagine you're an IT company, you're very successful, you're a managed service provider, and you've got all the banks and your clients and everything else and that. And then some individual from the central bank of knowledge makes up and goes, I don't really understand what you do, but I don't think you're compliant, so we're going to find it until the fear of Because that's what's going on. Okay, I'm just conscious of people's time, um, and thank you very much again for giving us your half day. Is there any other questions from the audience? We'll certainly take one or two. Here. So it's a non-technical question, so I'll apologise if that's right. Well, tech is good. You mentioned um, the role of insurance there yeah. in kind of fueling some of the bad actors, and um, particularly cyber insurance. And whilst it's a relatively new market, cyber insurance, it's already beginning to harden. So anybody who's from you to policy in the last kind of 12 months has seen their prices massively shit up. So I'm curious about your crystal ball. Where do you see cyber insurance going over the next five years? And what role do you see cyber insurance having in kind of the cyber resilience and business risk management perspective? Okay, it's a great question, Greg, because the, the, for most organizations, they will not have cyber insurance, even if it's a stupid policy, well, it's just, just a tick box kind of thing, it's like, oh, we have cyber insurance. But where some insurance companies need to get is to understand their clients, not know your customer, I was talking about, know your client properly, give them proper assessments, not these stupid subjective questionnaires that they send out, do you do that, do you have to take, do you have to take, what does that mean? It means nothing, right? So until that piece gets better, they won't be doing that recover. Um, rather. So, it, it, so for insurance companies, we can't do a midstream oil and gas in America, if it's similar to me, team, do an assessment, come back, and then they go for insurance. Obviously, for a lighter market for small stuff, they can't force you out. So, they need technology and innovation that will prove a level of security that people have. And then, clarity of what, what's, what's covered, not covered. Like, if you're, if you're uh, affected by something that is then proven to be the act or the knock on act of a state based cyber threat act, is that cyber warfare and you're not covered, or are you covered and it's criminality? Um, and that's why people are afraid to spend money, I think, on bringing So, crystal ball wise, I think there's probably going to be one emerging leader in this space that has some technology that makes this easy stream and people feel they're getting something for money. Because more, most clients that I talk to, we get some insurance, it's a tick box, what's the logic we get away with? Well, jump done. Um, but if they thought they were getting value, they would jump at cyber insurance. If they thought they were getting real cover um, and for what's going on. Because in cyber incidents, um, so I, I worked with companies like Mandy and Firewall and all the some of the biggest attacks in the world. And when you turn them on, we'll be billing a quarter million dollars within three or four days. Okay, so companies can't afford that. Okay, what company has a quarter million dollars in And that's just a situation where it's, do you want to work out who's hacking into you? Why are they doing it? What's going on? And that. So for most businesses, they'll work down and they don't want to come in that situation. So if you don't have deep pockets, um, Maersk, one of the, the, the talks that comes to me is very long, not catch it, the, the ransomware uh, attack that they hit Ukraine and hit you and all these kind of pop, pop, pop off things. Um, that hit Maersk. Um, they said it cost them about 300 million to uh, recover from that. And they just recovered by fluke. 300 million dollars sitting there. They heard, they gave an open checkbook to Deloitte, they got 600 people into May and said, fix this problem. We're out of business because one machine got affected in the in Ukraine uh, through a piece of hardware. Three hundred million. The the Department of Homeland Security estimated cost minimum ten billion 
And that doesn't include the effect then on things like healthcare, where patient records, which were judged through voice transcripts, were all gone because the company was wiped out that the voice transcripts suffer, those kind of things. So these numbers are massive. This isn't like I'm stealing a penny from you. This is, I figured out I'm stealing a penny, I'm going to destroy you the minutes. And that's the way yeah. Sarah thinks. It's different from prior, it's different from flood, it's different from the traditional mm -hmm. things that people are insured against on that because there's so many ways for them to it and it escalates so quickly. So, so quickly. And I, I, I dealt with a company, and I worked with a short time, I dealt with a company recently, and they had gone through their, their big four, um, six weeks, they were afraid to turn on the links for a data center in America, they didn't know whether there was anything left, and these were a very successful business, and um, they just didn't know how to handle these things. And the insurance company had sent in uh, um, so it's how we didn't know anything about Sire. And they were, instead of the owner of that company, the business leaders taking control, they were leaving it to the insurance company to control their business. So, where's the risk? <laughs> Is it from having insurance and not having insurance? So, there's all of those kind of things need to be worked out. The Christian Ball is where I, I think this ongoing immersion period can automate this, people to understand what's covered, what's not covered. And there's accountability and attestation evidence. So, if someone says they did have actually known question is, do you have any moment of percent of your state? Yes or no? Because if you don't, you don't have one. So that, that level of screen, it, it, it's just, so I'll give you that else. Excellent, I think we could be asking you questions. I, 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 can, I can project my voice, David, thanks. Okay. I'm okay. well used to it in, in, in my career, so the, the question I have for, for, for Paul, and, and maybe one or two, but I'll go with one firstly. Which is, you, you put up a diagram there about the different aspects to cyber security, the governance aspects, the policy aspects, and then the technology aspects, right? And, and the question I have to ask, in, in a lot of businesses out there in the fintech, regtech area, how tightly coupled are they, or are they loosely coupled? Because I, I took it from what the point you were making is that they need to be tightly coupled and integrated, right? And just from your experience you know across the industry what would you perceive it to be it really depends on the size of the company they talk about how innovative they are i mean we say things like government's risk compliance should be baked in not added on when it comes to cyber security because the cost and effectiveness of the cyber security controls if they're added on at the end of a project they're less effective and they're more costly so you bake it in to the whole process as, as you go through. Um, and so any innovative company that's creating something and deals with that aspect on the whiteboard when you start with, well, we've got this great technology out here, yada, 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 we're going to do this. Or how do we handle cybers? How do we handle compliance? You know, if that question isn't there on day one, it's not going to be great at the end of the day because somebody on the other side of that table will sell that solution to the world. Like, how do you handle it? Cyber security, how do you handle government cyber site, how do you handle those things within the application of the technology solutions? So, ideally, it should be tight, it should be from the very start, the embryonic side of any innovation that didn't know this actually. Yeah, so in some organizations, if they're, if they're software based, you know, they have the software developers, then they have the security, cyber security team, then they take a look at the code and say, hold on a minute, we need to redo this, redo that. And David, as a consequence of our engagement with industry, some years ago, we came up with a new stream, which was secure application development. Mm -hmm. So we were building developers that had security competencies built into them from the world goal. But, but security might be as opposed to compliance. But that's, that's, that's what, yeah, that's the, the, yeah, the, the governance the, compliance yeah. aspect, yeah. that's the bit there. How, how do you get that more tightly coupled? So you, you need to get the key stakeholders at the table at the start and say, we've got this great idea, we're creating a banking app. Um, we want your input from compliance, we want your input from head of privacy, what you're input from legal, what you're how would this operate? What countries is it going to operate? What kind of data is it going to hold? They're all the questions at the very start. So that you're designing it properly, not just that you've got secure passwords and encrypted information, but are you going to operate legally? You create a piece of technology and just will not be able to sell because it's not legal or you can't prove it's legal at the end of the day. So having all of those key stakeholders at the start, they can't be just an add-on at the end. They're also roadblockers because they can stop it all at the end. So you yeah. have all this great momentum and create something fantastic in your organization. This one without that should not speak because I can tell you don't we do. Um, and, and it's a showstopper. So get all of the bits it's back that picture of the people pulling together their key furniture. It's get the right people together at the start and it can go smoothly because it, it's not one set of brains, it's not one set of disciplines. You, you need to be involved at the start. And you might just get those people in from time to time to check and balance that everything is on track. 
but at the very start, they should be there to guide with um, Otherwise, you could deal with a disaster, as in you spend a long time, a lot of money and resources to develop something, and then the compliance fix is more costly than the actual product itself. Can I just ask, sorry, like, I, I'll be able to yeah. like, I'm posting. Um, just on, on the back of that, so I think it's great to hear you talk about cyber risk um, management as opposed to cyber security. I remember yeah. many years ago when I started out kind of in, in, the, in the technology area, boss of mine said the only way you can be secure is to plug everything out. <laughs> and it's still the same. So that was before uh, the year 2000 or whatever. But it's interesting to hear, you know, when you use the figures of the cost it is to organisations, and we know this, it's not new, but it is becoming more and more surfaced. Yet organisations are still not spending the money in order to, governments aren't spending the money as we know to do it either. And we know that we should have joined up thinking when we develop any soft, so whether, and we should always have done that, that's always been the theory. Yet the practice isn't that. Yeah. What, what, what can we do differently to, encourage people to do that so from a and I, i'm a lecturer here so we teach that that's yeah. what we teach we teach you need everybody to sit down together work together it needs to, you need to have alignment like exactly what you're saying it's still not happening <coughs> what what needs to happen okay. to make people I, I, do I, this i have a kind of a peculiar view of this i think yeah. a lot of this is exaggerated in Holland because we have a piece of dna called baby grant and no matter what goes on, we think, I'll be grand. I'll be sorted all out at the end of the day. That is not the attitude in other countries around the world, i.e. where the customers of your technology may be. They don't have that attitude of, I have to be grand. And we'll sort it all out at the end of the day. Um, when I talk to businesses, if they don't let me talk to the leader of that business, we don't engage. If the leader does not want to get engaged, well, then we just walk away because that's going to be a failed project, a failed engagement, and it's done. So we, we encourage that. And uh, so that we understand the importance of that piece. Then we, we, we educate a board, we generally board briefs, get the leaders on the page, so they understand what we're dealing here, what we're trying to do. Because you've got to get everybody on the same page. And they need to understand that this is an investment. It is the key to innovation and success as opposed to a cost. If people see this as a cost on the bottom line, like cleaning the toilets, whatever, then that's all they're going to see of us. So, it has to go above that. It's a business and neighbor, and they need to understand that it's your difference here in the market, mm. security, trust, all those things. That's hard sell. That's going in with selling skills to be able to say, this is why it's so important this organization. The key to success is getting cyber risk right. And you see that in, in London, it's very successful in the FinTech organization in the UK. They have embraced cyber risk and cyber security. Because the other piece is what we are seeing through legislation is um, people are simply out of business if they can't prove how, how secure they are. Um, we see this in procurement now where people are being forced almost to get ISO 2701 certification, which isn't the answer, but, but they're being forced to get some flag that they can go, hey, listen, we got this, so it's safe to deal with us. Um, that level of rising the tide, bringing all the boats up, is having a bit more of an effect. What people are seeing, hey, we're not getting those sales we thought we'd get because we don't have any way to evidence, approve, or provide assurance that we are secure. So um, if I'm going to board of directors, you've got to get that human link to why each one cares. Marketing cares about the brand, so Chief Marketing Officer cares about the brand. Chief Financial Officer, we're going to be fined. Revenue Officer, around money. And it really comes down to that human piece of what do they care about? Uh, from a selfish point of view, what do they care about? And sell it to them on that basis of they're not going to get the promotion, they're not going to hit their, their numbers, all those things, unless they get this right. It is the key to success. Uh, um, and most companies now, you pick by by name, are they an airline or a technology company? So technology company, the haps have urgency. <laughs> you know, all, everything is about data, data flow, and, and operations and everything else like that. And that's why you know organisations have to invest in understanding that, that that's why it's so important to do that. But it's it's more sales skills than anything to do. Them. We do walk away from clients that don't engage at that level because we just can't succeed. Paul, well, if I just jump in there, and I know time is is, is run now. When you talk about trust, that was one thing she started off at the first session. I thought that was a really astute observation. Trust is key to everything. Yeah selling, buying, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And do we have to work more on consumer and a company education about how important your securities are 
and, and what are the key, key identifiers to know that from a consumer the credentials are good for me to trade with them or from a corporate perspective that they realise this is really valuable stuff you need to pay attention to or is it that consumers are just too risky? You so, know, they're, they don't pay enough attention. Yeah, I mean, like, like we've been doing work in this space for, for many years with work with the suburbs, international greater suburb risk breaking scheme and so on that can work between companies so they can exchange the levels of subscribe without lifting the kimono and showing why they have vulnerabilities in certain areas. Um, it needs to be like a credit rating. Are you safe to do that? Yeah. And until we get there, we're not quite there. And unfortunately, the credit rating agencies try to go into cyber risk area, cyber sports, they're using really flawed techniques and approaches to this. Um, so we're getting too far into that. That, that it, it's not quite there yet, but yeah. there's a massive opportunity because it's how do I like the criminals get caught by it because they have they have uh, you know they have their escrow and the trust system yeah. pre dealing with so so you can learn from them sometimes. Yeah. Um, whereas and the little ratings between each other about is this guy safe to how good is the data he steals, how fast will it come, all that kind of stuff. Um, but when you're dealing with new business and a new client. Uh, Dealt with client assignments before. Who are they? And, oh, or I'm, I'm going to uh, use this small app for doing maybe mailing list or something like that. Looks like a decent website, decision made, credit card. Well, it's not about losing the $50 credit card. It's did that just put malware in my system? Yeah. Am I just giving 40,000 you know, email addresses away to somebody? Um, you know, those kind of decisions are made. Great. But all these are about informing all of your people to be business protection officers. To make those kind of decisions, they all we all need to absorb some of this responsibility from a community perspective within a business and within society. But we're all taking the, the, these safeguards. I mean, if you change the default passwords on on the two devices. Yeah. I mean, as soon as you show somebody that, they all go home and change all the default passwords. You know, if I click here and click on the camera and win, that's it. They'll go back to So it's once they carry. It, they, they'll be Thank you. Okay, I think we probably should wrap it up shortly. Uh, I just want to let the audience know that I got a very nice gift from Paul just before he made the presentation Cyber Risk Leadership. And I'm sure, I'm not lying totally, but there's probably one for everyone in the audience who wrote this bookshop. Most of all, I'm already So, listen, one, 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 one final thing to say. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. My strategy is to contact all of you again very, very shortly asking you to become a strategic partner with us in the whole area of FinTech Learning Labs so that we can have more master classes and we can engage together. One round of applause left for all of you.